I'm East to please. So that's going to be the case. Would you say your name Josh or Brumley? Yeah, Josh. Car crash call Josh. That's our slogan. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Yesterday is Josh Brumley. Josh, thanks for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jason. So, Josh, hopefully, what I hope we got starting off a softball question. You know, you, you're going to go do a deep dive, all the great things you're doing, work, personal, you know, you know your, your closet and stuff. But what do you do for fun, right? Like, what do you do, like, you know, to kind of cool down and, you know, that kind of stuff? Well, I have a 90 pound golden doodle. He spends a lot of time at work with me. And so when we're not at work, we like to do stuff outdoors, you know, hiking, that kind of Seattle, Washington, uh, Mount Rainier type stuff. That's a, that's a good way to spend my free time. Um, I used to play in punk bands. I like to go watch live music whenever I can, anywhere, you know, from here to Oregon or uh, Canada sometimes as well. Just when touring bands that I appreciate come through on a day that I can get away, then I'll I'll go catch them. So go go doodle. That's like a combination retriever and a poodle, or yeah yeah a golden bit. retriever. So is that like a genetically made up dog from humans or something? Or yeah yeah, they're actually you're not able to get them papered for like breeders or whatever because they're a made up breed. Apparently, <laughs> he's imaginary. <laughs> That's crazy, right, man? Um. Yeah, one thing about Seattle, Seattle does have a good music scene, right? I mean, like, there's always good concerts here. Um, I think Jelly Roll is going to be here in August. Mm -hmm. Arsenal is coming. And, like, two doors down from where right now is a place called Central Saloon. Mm -hmm. Supposed to be open since 1892. They always have good music there. But I've been in Central Saloon, like, maybe four or four times because, you know, I'm kind of, you know, older. I have to go drive home and stuff. So mm -hmm. the music starts at 9 o'clock at night usually, right? It's kind of past my bedtime. Oh, man, that's late, yeah. But the times I go, I've been, like, four times. Every time I go, like, like you, you as they're a band, like you're like, man, you are so fucking good. Like, what are you doing here, right? Why are you <laughs> yeah. not selling out a hundred of this house? And then like the very next band were like, Y'all must have no friends. <laughs> so y'all are horrible, right? Like, <laughs> my, my eardrums are bleeding right now. Yeah, no, there's a, a wide variety of musicians in in our state. Um, and everyone's got their own taste, but I don't like everything I hear, that's for sure. Yeah. So how do you why do you why do you think like I know Seattle, LA, Austin? Some other and asked for like knows like being big music cities. How do you think Seattle became a music city? I know way back in the day, like um, it was a big jazz place. You come, Chrissy Jones was here. Other jazz musicians. I wonder how that happened. You know, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with just the rainy weather. There's, you know, a lot more uh, depression in Seattle, and and uh, those kinds of feelings make for good music. Maybe that has something to do with it. The artists that are from here are, you know, world renowned and. They're dealing with the same winters that we're dealing with now, and people people have feelings about that. So maybe that has something to do with it. So were you a singer, a guitar player? What is your role in your uh, in your band? <laughs> well, I I was a a vocalist for a band, and I played bass for a couple different bands, bass guitar. Okay, and you still doing that or? No, I um, I I haven't in a while. I still own a bass guitar, but I'm not playing music anymore. It's it's such a fun thing, but. As as I got older and all the people I played music with got older, it, it sort of became like had a, had a grow up so focus. To speak. Yeah, I focus on your career or focus on playing music. And while playing music's fun, it's not gonna. It might it might buy you a house, yeah. but the odds of that happening instead of just you know focusing on your career and and getting getting some money in the bank account instead of eating top ramen and Taco Bell, <laughs> you know that's that's what we were doing when we were touring and stuff. So it was not the life for a. 30 year old or close to 40 year old now um so it's like playing the, the bass guitar pretty much like riding the bike if you like got your guitar you probably just picked it up pretty instantly well yeah i was never very great at it but i i'm positive that if i picked up a bass guitar right now i could still play a lot of the stuff that i used to be able to play it's kind of just muscle memory yeah. and so once it's in your fingers it's there forever yeah. it's just hard to forget and like when you were when you were playing, I guess you were playing every night. You have to like go get like finger massages and stuff like that, or like no, you know, no, you know, I like take care of your hands or fingers, or whatever. No, you get calluses on your yeah. fingers, and then the more you're playing, the easier it is to play longer. And okay. so when you tour and you're playing every night, it was just, it was, it wasn't even like work, man. It yeah. was, it was just fun hanging out with my friends, playing in bands, and then going out to Denny's afterwards. <laughs> <laughs>
So what's the biggest crowd y'all ever played in front of? Um, well, one of the bands I was in toured in Hawaii. Um, one of the bands I was in in law school, uh, we played a big festival in Jacksonville, Florida. That was oh, really wow, awesome. Okay. Um, one of the bands that I was in here played a music festival that happened here in Seattle every year called Rain Fest. There's there was a lot of big festivals, okay. but we weren't the headlining band yeah. by by any means. It yeah. was always the crowd was there for the bigger bands, and we just got to uh, perform with those bands. So. And why punk rock? Is this like the genre you like the best, or you play the best, or any reason for that? Well, I make the joke that uh, people who uh, play punk music, in at least with bass guitar, bass guitar is an instrument that anyone could pick up and learn how to play, even if they have no musical talent. You wouldn't be great at it. There's definitely great bass guitarists. Um, I just was never a musical person, but something about bass guitar just kind of worked for me. And I, I mean, I can hold a guitar and play a couple things on a guitar, but I can't play guitar in a band. I can sit at a drum set and goof around, but I could not play drums in a band. And uh, the musicians that I see that you know really play bass guitar, those are real musicians. I, I never considered myself a musician. I just know how to play bass guitar in a punk band and so if if you're asking about you know a blues band or something like that that's a whole other world compared to what i was doing in these punk bands but um the the music i think just it was it was something that i connected to immediately when i started going to local mu music shows and and seeing these people that were in bands that were not it wasn't like being at the tacoma dome or being at some arena, you know, it was it was much more accessible feeling, and the band was not someone that you put on a pedestal. The band was someone who was standing in the crowd with you 15 minutes before watching the other band, and so that was something that I really appreciated because it it kind of it made it feel accessible to me. And I said, well, if if these are just regular guys standing here that go up on stage 15 minutes later and put on a guitar and play a couple songs and then hang out afterwards and we all go to Denny's, then you know, that could be something I'm into. And I just had to make friends with enough musicians to start my own band. And how long were you doing the music thing? Years. Um, I, I started my own live music spaces in Tacoma. That was probably what led me to being an attorney, actually. Um, I started a, a live music space in Tacoma that got shut down by the city and then started another one that got shut down by the city and then started a third one that got shut down by the city. And these were only open like a month at a time, not a not an incredible amount of time. Um, and the fire marshal kept shutting them down because they didn't meet the criteria for, um, uh, for places where people would gather. You know, um, like a bar has sprinklers and all these bathroom requirements and just laws that affect when you have a, a public occupancy space. And so... Um, I had to learn what those laws were so that I'd stop getting shut down. And then um, I actually had to go down to the city of Tacoma's like engineering building. And I was like 18 at the time, 19, something like that. Um, and, and argue with the engineers in the city and say, well, we're not, we're not serving alcohol, so we shouldn't be held to the same standards as a bar. We're closer to, you know, a roller skating rink and what are those requirements and they looked at the codes and said well if you're a roller skating rink and you're this many square feet it's this that applies and so we we started our first live music space as a 501c3 nonprofit called viaduct and it was me and and many different people there was there was a lot of people involved with that space and um that space uh ended up closing down years later and then i went away to law school came back from law school and then restarted that nonprofit. Um, and it is still operating now in Tacoma on uh, South Tacoma Way and 56th Street. It's not called the Viaduct anymore. It's called Real Art Tacoma when we reopened it under the new name. Um, there were different people involved. And shout out to Tom Long. He's running the space um, years after I stopped being involved. That's still it. going on right now. It's still going on right now. You could go see it. There was, there was shows there last weekend. Yeah. Every week, they, they have a, a, a bunch of shops inside and, and cafe and all sorts of cool stuff they're doing down there. It's really awesome. You said it's on 56 in South Tacoma Way? Yeah, Real Art Tacoma. Okay. They have like like things every weekend to do? Every, yeah, like sometimes four times a week. It's, okay. it's 
very busy space, and that's how they they stay open is the live music and the cafe. So please support it any way you can. I guess like different kinds of music usually. Or oh yeah, tons of stuff. You can even rent the space out if you wanted to throw your own event. Okay. So moving on, um, you told me earlier during before we start, you're you're a vegan. Uh, just vegetarian. vegetarian. Uh, I'm a fence walker. Yeah. So what's the veg- difference between vegan and vegetarian? Well, vegan is no animal products at all. So vegans don't wear leather. They don't have down jackets. They don't have down pillows. They don't, a lot of them don't use honey in their drinks. They um, don't do any dairy. They don't do milk chocolate. It's, it's no animal byproducts at all whatsoever. Um, vegetarian just means you don't eat anything that's made of meat. How long have you been doing that? I've been a vegetarian since me and this guy started a bet of who could be vegetarian longer, uh, probably 2000, gosh, 2010 or something like that, 2009. And um, he lasted about two months. He went on tour and then he called me from some steakhouse in Las Vegas and said, hey, man, uh, you won. And I, I, I'm still going just in case uh, if he became vegetarian again, I don't want him to catch up to me. Yeah. So, so I got to keep going. Nice. And how do you think it's improved or not improved your health? Well, I still love to eat like shit. So I eat pizza and Taco Bell and whatever else, chicken, fake chicken nuggets and stuff like that. I don't do it for health purposes. I do it for animal purposes. And so a lot of my vegan friends are like, well, then you should be vegan because why are you doing half the work? Um, but I'd be like, I, but doing half the work is better than doing no other work. Uh, I think so, and and you know, I, give, I gotta give this guy some credit. <laughs> well, you know, the the vegan community is is very vocal about why everyone should be vegan, and and it makes a lot of sense. You know, when you start to do that research and you start to look into how animals are treated in factory farming, and um, you know, there's there's all these documentaries that are coming out. Netflix has been really great for sharing stuff like Seaspiracy, which is just heinous the the type of stuff that um that people do in in commercial fishing and stuff like that and how we're destroying the oceans and how those ecosystems are going to affect the rest of the world and it's it's really sad and humanity's the devil but um you try your best and and i i i have phased out dairy milk i don't drink any dairy in my coffee or have dairy ice cream in the house they have Ben and Jerry's has like vegan ice cream now. So you still get all the cookie dough and all the good flavors without any of the dairy. And I just don't want to um, say that I've committed to veganism if I've not. And um, a lot of my diet is vegan. Okay. Um, so it's 2010, that's a long time. Is there any like food that you miss? Like, like you might smell a steak, like, man. Or like a hamburger or something, or are you, are you doing it so long it doesn't even phase you no more? You know, I think I think more often I smell something that smells disgusting to me. Um, when you're hungry, your body reacts to like smells, and you're like, "Oh, that smells so good! I'm so hungry!" This and that. Um, but now that my body, I, I haven't eaten meat in so long. I mean, I I can still have an Impossible Burger, a Beyond Burger, all these different. Um, meat alternatives that exist you know there's fake hot dogs there's fake sausages there's starbucks has uh, beyond breakfast sandwiches there's just so much out there in the way of alternative meat products and so i don't miss regular burgers i don't miss steaks i don't miss any of that um but what i will say is that drinking dairy milk like if starbucks messes up my order it's almost like the milk has curdled. Yeah. It smells sour. It's disgusting. It just makes you want to vomit. And I can't imagine um, ever drinking dairy milk again. I think it's the most disgusting thing in the world. Yeah. So I was actually a vegetarian in 2019 for a whole year. Mm-hmm. I have to say, I never felt better, never felt more focused, right? Yeah. But with the challenge was, it's not like every day, like my wife would make it something great. My kids would make something great. Like you never did this for doing vegetarian shit, you know, like yeah. cut the shit out right. <laughs> I am. Um, well, I I'm a single guy. I don't have I don't have a wife. I don't have kids. So, you know, when it's when it's just me at the house and I'm gonna cook, it's easier than if I'm living with people who are not vegetarian yeah. or something like that. So, that that might change, you know, the calculus a lot. But when it comes down to is like, you know, you you hear about how animals are treated in these factory farms, and we don't call it cow. We call it beef. You know, we don't call it eating a pig. We call it bacon. And um, 
when you interact with these animals and you understand that these are living creatures that have their own personalities and and lives that people are just it's it's someone's job to slaughter all these pigs it's someone's job to slaughter all these cows and what's that person like to spend time with you know think about what that person's job is for eight hours a day working at a factory farm just considering those lives as bacon as, but, as but cow. what if we didn't quote unquote kill all these animals right like i know in texas is a big problem with the feral pigs being everywhere like wouldn't they be wouldn't these all these seem to be overpopulation like they're like just that cows and pigs and i'm just making this up like overproduced, yeah. so to speak right uh I, i'm not familiar with uh any anywhere where you know cows roaming and and getting into you know your garbage cans and starting to graze in your backyards would be an issue if a cow wandered into my backyard and was grazing i would be fucking hyped about it if a pig was wandering around in my backyard i hope my dog would just befriend it and they start a little pig and dog mm -hmm. type of gang that'd be cool um i i've not heard of any uh, over um production or or feral pig stuff in texas but if that's the case you know that's that's a, a an issue that i'd gladly deal with over the alternative okay and so if if we have too many animals wandering around in our communities i don't see that as as big of an issue as as we are paying people to destroy their humanity or or encouraging people to have you know no humanity in slaughtering animals that's just such a if if you ask a person on the street would you slaughter your own cow overwhelmingly the answer is going to be no 99.99 yeah no. yeah Most no. people have no idea where the food comes from. yeah they have, and, they don't have a clue and so what kind of like serial killer type person is working in these places that every day they're just like hey it's just another day at the office where i'm slaughtering pigs like that's just a concept to me that is mind-boggling and if people take the the ignorance is bliss out of the equation i think a lot more people would eat vegetarian but or, or vegan or or just an animal free you know meat free mondays and things like that so i i tried to um not be like some of my vegan friends where i'm pushy and bossy and and disgusted that, by people yeah, but that, that's the turns people off me cause I think. absolutely yeah i think i think you you catch more flies with honey that's been my um negotiation style as a lawyer and and um you just you have to be open and honest and communicate well with people who are open and honest and interested and never say you're disgusting for ordering that burger but when they ask you about what you're eating say hey yeah you want to bite it's delicious so i might even make this up but what do you say to those people who claim that humans are meat eaters based on how our teeth are aligned something like that uh well humans are, I, I don't know how true that is i just remember hearing that somewhere there's there's like science behind the fact that humans are omnivores and and how our bicuspids and all these other things you know that that has nothing to do with me. I didn't create my teeth. I just grew up one day and had them. And uh, I, I really, I could care less what my teeth are shaped like. It has to do with how I feel about killing an animal. And, and if I'm less healthy, which I don't believe I am, but if I was less healthy for not eating meat, I could care less. And then, um, I don't know how true this is either. I remember here somewhere that of course, a lot of vegans and vegetarians that say don't kill you no know, animals because blah blah. But how about when like all these all these like everything's planted like corn, potatoes? I've heard that that actually kills a lot of animals too, like squirrels and rodents and stuff too. I, like I said, I don't know how true that is, you know? Or yeah, no, I don't. I don't know uh, the science behind any of that either. I'm not familiar with those facts, but I can tell you that like again, it, so <laughs> the the um. What's the what's the phrase that I'm uh, demand follows uh, uh, or or industry follows demand? That's that's the phrase. So so you know corporations, you know big food manufacturing companies, meat manufacturing companies. If overnight people said I'm not going to buy ground beef, I'm going to buy fake ground beef. Those companies wouldn't go out of business. They would transition into that industry, and so we're never going to get around 
corporate America being uh, uh, controlling what gets produced and things like that. But the, the legislative process can help protect people, can help protect, you know, animals, can help protect growing fields and, and do what's right for humanity as a whole rather than what's best for these corporations right now, which is fill these animals full of growth hormones and then feed them to yeah, young that children. Yeah, that was the ethics fucked up, right? Yeah, right? Like, like, like I, you hear about like growth hormones in milk and milk is a part of like every public school and then these children are going through puberty at like nine and 10 years old. Ridiculous. It's, it's disgusting that, that that's something that humanity is just okay with because propaganda from corporate America. One thing a lot of people in America don't realize, like, cause most Americans don't travel, right? I, I travel a lot. You know, I've been to v I was Vietnam last year, Mexico recently. I was in the army all over the place. Like food tastes so much better, so much fresher overseas. Right. It's just like, the fruits, the vegetables, the meat, it just, that's it's a different taste, right? Yeah. I don't know if it's because of the hormones or what it is, but this it, I think that has a lot to do with it. You can taste the difference. I mean, it's not close. It, it just tastes fresh over there. Yeah. I think, here. I think um, in a lot of countries, they, they don't allow a lot of the same preservatives or, or growth hormones and things like that in their, in their food products. And, you know, that's, that's a, a conversation maybe for, maybe for today, maybe for a different day. I don't know how much time you got, but, um, that goes to just like capitalism, right? Yeah. Like we, we have a system that's meant to, to encourage the lowest cost, highest profits yeah. for production of anything. And if that means it's unhealthy, but people are buying it, it's their right as an American to buy it and to kill themselves. Yeah. Unfortunately. Have you heard of the carnivore diet? <laughs> yeah. The carnivore diet. Yeah. Did you hear that that guy that like was like, Famous the, for the, promoting it, the, he was the, just lying. The liberal guy. Yeah, yeah. My God, that was ridiculous. So it's funny to me, like if you like I just you know with my limited education, you, if I listen, just listen to someone who's like all in on vegan vegetarian, like they sprout stats and facts and metrics. And, Man, this sounds it has to be true. And then someone from the carnivore side does the same thing. Like it can't be openly true, right? They can't both. So like I would like to see like a like an all in vegan guy debate an all in carnivore diet, right? Yeah, like on live TV somewhere. Or, Back, or like a, a fist fight, like a, a <laughs> an MMA. There's, there's, there's a, um, gosh, I can't think of his name right now. A famous uh, athlete. There's a lot of famous athletes that are vegan, actually. Yeah, but, um, um, but I would love to see once and for all a carnivore fight a professional fighter who's vegan, and and just once and yeah. for all put that to rest. A lot of people, oh, if you're a vegan, you're not strong. I mean, you get plenty of protein from different things, right? Yeah, you just have to be smart about what you're eating, and that's everybody. And most people don't care about the vitamins that they're eating today. They're not counting calories. They're yeah. not, no, you know, they're eating fast food and, and, and whatever's most people, easy. Most people wake up drinking Dr. Pepper and have, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. And have, I, like, having six donuts on Krispy Kreme. Oh, man, I love donuts. But yeah, yeah, people don't care about their health. They And, and so that argument... If you're coming to me and saying, "How do you get protein?" Uh, it's not that hard. There's there's protein in a million different things, yeah. you know. And and these alternative meat products are a great way to just swap out what you're already eating yeah. and cook the same meals. I have beef stroganoff and and like I said, hot dogs and like burgers and all sorts of chicken and. So do you have like a favorite vegetable or fruit? Like your go-to fruit or vegetable that you like really like. I think Love. I could eat my body weight in cauliflower or broccoli. Okay. And since I was a little kid, even though it's like stinky, I even love the stinky smell of steamed broccoli. And uh, my grandmother used to always say, um, it's good for your brain. And I'd well, say, well, I'm going to be the smartest you, you, guy in the you world. You keep then. that to yourself. <laughs> I ain't messing with broccoli, cauliflower. What I really hate, I hate beets. Oh, yeah. I, I can not stand beets. Uh, I'm not a celery guy. I used okay. to work in, in produce at Fred Meyer. And every time I would stock the celery, I'd have to just go, go wash my hands and just get that smell of celery off yeah. me. It smells like dirty water. I can't believe people eat celery. It's so good for you. But again, I'm I'm not motivated by my health mm -hmm. to eat the things I eat. You know, it's like moral reason. Oh, and, and and what tastes good, you know? Yeah. So celery will never taste good to me. No matter what you put on it, you put peanut butter and raisins on it, you're just ruining peanut butter and raisins. <laughs> <laughs> I'll eat peanut butter and raisins without celery. Nice. So you definitely committed this lifestyle that's good. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. many people out there, like, do something for a couple of months, and then, like, they, they give all this, oh, I'm this, I'm that. And then before you know it, they're 
out of it, you know? You know, I, I don't want to shit talk because I think that that's really important because that shows... Uh, I was vegetarian for a couple months before I recommitted to it later in life. And I think that that shows you're you're open to just trying new things. Very much. I mean, yeah, too, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if you spend a month not eating meat, you helped animals to live longer lives. That's great, you know. And and the more people that do it, the more that the industry will follow that demand for consumption. The more that um, alternative meat companies will be able to show profits rather than losses for creating alternatives that taste good that are maybe more expensive to create because they've never existed before. Yeah. So how many times do you get to eat a day? Oh, man. I'm kind of always been a snacker. So I, I'm not a big meal for okay. breakfast, big meal for lunch, big meal for dinner guy. I do like a big meal for dinner and then just kind of snack and have coffee okay. throughout the day. Yeah. Have you ever done a water fast? Hell no. No, I, I have to eat small portions yeah. regularly. Does but if I did a water fast, man, I'd probably... You could do it. I, I don't know. I feel like... I suppose you were not meant to eat like... Maybe two hours, right? You know, back yeah. during the day, we, yeah. we, you know, we even days out eating until we kill some big ass elephant. Yeah, you know, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. I think uh, you could do. I'm too, I'm too, uh, too sensitive. sensitive. Uh, yeah, I'll just, I would, I would be like, man, I'm too hungry. I, I, I think also part of my routine, and and I think I'm an incredibly productive person seven days a week i'm i'm i was at my office it's saturday right now i was at my office before coming here i'll probably go back to my office and continue putting in a full eight hours today after this podcast is recorded but the only time i really turn off in a day is while i eat my dinner okay and so that's like a a religious like event for me sitting down yeah. stop going 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 turn my brain off just be thankful and and that's one thing I've gotten better. I used to be the person I could eat, eat, eat dinner or lunch, whatever, still I'll be working. I've yeah. made, I've made a constant effort. When I, if I'm eating, I don't care if I'm eating like a, you know, a banana, a candy bar. If I'm eating, I like, I'm, that's the only thing I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. That, I think that's good. Just be thankful for the, the moment of peace that you have. Be thankful for the, the food that you're eating and, and understand that other people throughout the world don't have it like we have it, man. Yeah. So, not on the same thing of MMA, but do you think about this Mike Tyson, Logan Paul fight, or Jake Paul fight, who are the dude is, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't wait to see Mike Tyson slaughter that guy. I hope he bites his ear off. That'll be funny. I do. I know this, it's going to be in uh, Cowboy State, 18 Stadium, right? I kind of my daughter lives there. I kind of want to go to see the fight in person. Right? Well, if you if you go, man, let's get two tickets. I'll I'll fly with you, man. That I just like yeah, I want I want, I want Mike Tyson. Have you seen like the clips of him like practicing and like? Yeah, they're crazy. He's, he's a dude, beast. Like, I, yeah, I I I dude, can't imagine. Seven years old. What the fuck? He was he was the heavyweight champion for a reason, right? Like he's yeah. Uh, no one can match him. No one can match him. And like those don't mean Mike Tyson loses. Only way is like is it a fix in? He's like, but yeah, yeah. Mike paid. Tyson has too much ego to do that shit. And and he's got money already. He doesn't yeah. need money. That guy's that guy's set. He's been in movies. He's he's done all sorts of stuff. Rick Ross albums. You know. I can imagine. Like, what would you possess you want to fight Mike Tyson? Right? That's not that's not much. That means the world. The media, you, man. You, you I mean, you this paid me a billion dollars. The. We're talking about what's his name right now. We still don't even know his damn name, Jake Paul, yeah. Martin Paul, whatever the hell his name yeah. is. Who cares about that guy? We're talking about Mike Tyson and how he's the best. That's oh, what we're oh, talking about. Or maybe that dude gets in this runs around the whole that's a run, runs around. Yeah, it just know? runs from him for twelve rounds yeah. and then it's it's over. Um no, I I I wish them both luck in their fight and I hope Mike Tyson wins by I just hope no one gets hurt permanently, right? <laughs> Did you see that thing was a few years ago when Mike Tyson was playing? The dude behind him was fucking with him, and Mike Tyson turned around and just fucking like blast, like hit him like three or four times. No, I didn't hear about yeah, that. Yeah, happened a few years ago, right? It ended up the guy who was like fucking with him was like a fucking was out on parole, was at the base of a bad person, you know? Oh, jeez. He was like he was hitting Mike Tyson back head. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. As a matter of fact, Mike Tyson was here. The dude was over here. The dude got out of his seat, sat behind Mike Tyson, fuck, fuck his head and shit, you know? Mike Tyson, no, leave me alone, dude. Leave me alone. And then like, like you just seen Mike like. Snap. Snap, yeah. I, and like, I, the quickest combination you ever like you've seen in a while. <laughs> and the, like, the dude was all fucked up and shit, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, that's I I I don't know why anyone would pick a fight with Mike Tyson, but with Mike bless, Tyson. Bless Mike Tyson's heart for coming out and saying, Well, you asked for it, you're gonna get it. I like suppose like Mike Tyson right now, 
and you say, call me Mike, I'd be like, yes, Mr. Tyson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, Mr. That, yes, Mr. Tyson. What that's can not I do? someone you want to pick a fight with. Mr. Tyson, just... what can I do for you? Yeah, that dude might die. I don't know. It's crazy. So um, you have a you have a book coming out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been working on it since last year. Um, it's called Protect Your Neck. Uh, it's a guy. Isn't like a Wu Tang song or something? Yeah, uh, yeah. That's that is a Wu Tang song. Uh, we we do a lot of play on words at the firm, and um, my my law firm is a personal injury law firm. We focus on a lot of uh, car accident style cases, um, and so protecting your neck has implications of whiplash and like how to get treatment for your neck, that kind of thing. And uh, I just, everybody loves Wu-Tang. So it made sense to do that um, unofficial collaboration. And so that's what we named the book. The book is uh, hopefully going to be released end of summer this year. There'll be a big book release party. I'm sure you'll get invited. And um, it's, it's really just like a how-to guide of working through a personal injury case to maximize your settlement, understanding what the insurance company is going to say before they say it, because they say the same shit every time. You have a gap in your treatment. You didn't treat fast enough. You had an intervening injury. You had pre-existing disc degeneration. You know, all the same things and understanding that your social media, your significant other's social media is going to be monitored by the insurance company to find any, any way that they can to throw shade at, at your argument before it gets in front of a jury. So how many times have you had a client right and you know they're injured or whatever and then during the trial or the, whatever you want to call it the back and forth you know in the insurance company or other lawyer they plot a video so you said your client was hurt now why the fuck is he like you know lifting 20 pounds or you know doing whatever the case may be where at the gym cannot do this right snowboarding yeah snowboarding uh, that's a good one snowboarding. yeah man they I, and you're like looking at client like, what the fuck is this right well you know that's what the insurance wants people to believe is the case but people aren't going to stop living their life because they have an injury. People are going to live their life in spite of their injury. And so if an insurance company tries to aha moment me and say, look at your client, go into this rave, and obviously they're not injured, I'm going to say, my client is a hero. My client, in spite of her pain, continues to try like to live that. her life like that to the best of that her. Is so great. And, and I dare you to put that in front of a jury and let my client testify about how much pain she was in. And she still didn't want her friends to go to that rave alone because she didn't want her friends to be taken advantage of. And she was there to help protect her friends. You really want to put that in front of a jury over a back injury instead of just writing or, or, a check? Or even better, like suppose the mother went skiing with her daughter. Yeah. It was my daughter's first time skiing. I couldn't let her go by herself, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and skiing is a different thing than it's more physical mm -hmm. than like walking around a, a live music event. But the live music event was one that was recently in, in the argument that I was having. But it's just insurance companies have one job to do, and that's to prevent paying out money. That's it. They collect your insurance premiums, and then they prevent ever paying them back to you and or to the people that are injured by your actions. And so they they don't exist without making a profit. And so insurance adjusters are trained on looking for reasons to minimize the value of these claims. And once you know what those arguments are, it's the same arguments on every case. And a good attorney is going to be prepared to make counter arguments and say why that's bullshit. So how about this? I suppose, suppose, you know, knock on this plastic table. I have an accident tomorrow, right? Uh -huh. I get kind of hurt. An insurance company offers me, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. Here's $2,500. And I take it, right? $2,500. And there's I'll... no case worth $2,500. Yeah. I hope nobody who's listening to this ever takes $2,500 for any amount of pain and suffering so I, at all, ever. I take $2,500 because I'm like, you know, I'm stressed out, blah, 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 you know, all this stuff on me. And two like, what the fuck have I done? Mm -hmm. And I call you or call any lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. Is it like the question, like once you accept that money for insurance company, is that is a done deal? It's a done deal. That's there's done there's deal. no there's no okay. buyer's remorse. Okay. After you sign on the dotted line, okay. you don't That's get it. to reopen the case. There's no, hey, they tricked they, me or. Nope, nope. No. And, and it's really sad because that's their goal in the very beginning of a case to try to cut you off from going to get legal re representation and understanding what your legal rights are before the case explodes into something more valuable. And you don't know if you have a back injury or a neck yeah, injury that's going to affect you yeah, for the you rest of your life. Even like 
a week late. Oh uh, man, you don't. And and so that's why in this industry, all the attorneys, every attorney who works on on personal injury cases, car accident cases, every person in the entire state of Washington will give you a free consultation. And we don't charge up front for working on these cases. We get a percentage of the recovery we get. So there is absolutely no reason not to talk to an attorney every single time you're in a car accident case, even if they say you're at fault. If you believe you're not at fault, call an attorney because they can get that liability decision overturned. So how about this? Like most people don't have an attorney on speed dial, right? Yep. You know, most people like, and then like you have the phone book or commercials, like, like, you know, like. How do you know what one's good yeah, and what one's bullshit? You know, yeah. yeah. It's, it's tough. Um, you know, I, I like to be seen as a resource in the community of, you know, like I said, musicians and, and punk people that don't have a lawyer that they could just send a DM on Instagram to. I'm incredibly accessible. I think, you know, our generation is used to having that incredible accessibility and lawyers are not historically incredibly accessible. <laughs> and so, you know, that they're a nine to five Monday through Friday. And even if you can get through to someone at their office, you're not talking to the lawyer. If you send an Instagram message right now to Brumley Law Firm, you're going to get directly to my phone. My phone is lighting up while we're having this podcast. If I don't respond to you the same day, it's because, you know, God forbid I'm in the hospital or something because I am constantly working and there are not attorneys that work the way that my firm works, the the time frames that my firm works. People have families, people are committed to spending that that time in a way that like I said, it's a religious thing. You you put your phone away, you you do your thing. And that's okay, but that means I'm more accessible than those other firms. And that's something that I think is an incredible industry advantage. And, um, you know, things like this, going out into the community and being a resource, I, I think it's really important. I've done criminal defense work. I've done tickets. I've done uh, family law. I've done all sorts of stuff. I, I'm involved with putting on clinics for the communities. I, I try really hard to be a resource that's accessible all the time to anyone who needs it. And if it's something that I can't help people with because I don't take family law cases anymore and I don't take criminal defense cases anymore, you bet your ass I, I have a resource that I'm going to connect you to that I've already vetted. And I'm not going to send people that I care about to someone who's going to do a bad job. So let's talk about insurance for a minute, right? I mean, I think insurance is needed at all, but man, but sometimes this thing seems like a scam, right? Like I've been like, I haven't been, I haven't caused accidents. Everybody I've like had two fender bears. People like hit me from behind. Insurance pay for all the all the stuff, right? Yeah. But it's like, man, like you know, you're paying like whatever is per month, you know, based on your skill, age, whatever. Yeah. Like, man, you're paying like thousand dollars of a lifetime of insurance policy, and maybe only get ten percent back. You know, of course, I know they need to make profit, all that kind of stuff. But yeah. it's like this thing has to be a better way, right? Now, of course, they didn't get like you don't have no insurance, and you get a major accident. Do you really have like twenty thousand dollars to pay? Yeah, you know, right? It's it's it's. Um, I was having this conversation with one of my paralegals, and I laughingly said, "Hey, uh, Dylan, if you're listening to this, I said, Dylan, if you don't like it, there's the door. You can go work for Geico." Um, we were joking with each other. I obviously don't want Dylan to quit. I love Dylan, but um, it was he, he was he was making a joke that we're so successful, we're the reason that insurance premiums are higher, and I said. I said, that's absolutely not true. These insurance companies are making billions of dollars every year. It's not because of Brumley Law Firm and the successful litigation and tactics that we use to maximize the value of these claims that insurance rates go up. It's because these companies exist to take money and do nothing and earn you know, investment income and all these other things that they do from the premiums they collect from people every single day. I, I can sleep like a baby taking money from these giant insurance companies for people who have a hard time getting to work after their car is damaged. You know, like that's, that's absolutely uh, uh, something that I don't feel bad doing. And um, Dylan said, you know, it's pooled risk management. People don't have $20,000 in a bank account if they're, the cause of an accident so insurance companies have to exist but by litigating against them and causing uh them to to bleed money for defending these claims that are going into litigation and going to trial and all this uh we're driving the cost of insurance up and i said i i just don't believe that man and and i understand your position 
we got a job to do here. And our job is to represent the people who are injured from the negligence of someone else and to get every penny we can for the person who we represent. That's our job. And, you know, personal preference aside, Dylan, if that's something that's hard for you, I understand. But I've got 10 people that'll take your spot in this job if you don't want to do it. So if you can't answer this question, I understand, right? But is there any, like two part question? Is there what insurance company, like, you know, of course they try to, you know, get as much money as they can, but they're actually like in their own way, like do the right thing, you know, so to speak. Yeah. And the other one, the other side, like this fucking all the way, like fucking this crappy, like bullshit company. All they, all they do is try to fuck people around. I think different adjusters who we negotiate with have um, a better moral compass than others. I think uh, as a whole, um, Geico is the worst insurance company. I think uh, we have a joking. Uh, I mean, isn't this a thing where like the more commercial you have a TV, the worse company you are? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, you know, they have like five different spokesmen: the the bundle of money, the caveman, the gecko yeah, lizard. Yeah. Like, why do you need three different slogans? And they're on all the time. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah, like, you know, and the Super Bowl neutral, neutral. And, and but but Geico has we have this phrase: um, if if you have a case against Geico. It's get sued from the get go because Geico won't negotiate. They'll offer you 500 bucks and we just have to file the lawsuit. A lot of these cases get resolved without filing the lawsuit. And that's always our goal because filing the lawsuit increases the work for both parties, the defense for the insurance company and for um, our client and what we have to do. You know, there's depositions, there's interrogatories, there's requests for production of tax returns, all sorts of different stuff that, that come into play. But if you can, get a case resolved um, through your reputation of being litigious and your reputation of being an attorney who doesn't back down from, from trial or arbitration um, and get the maximum value of the case without having to file that lawsuit. Your client wins, the insurance company pays what they need to pay out, which is the maximum value, whatever their policy limit is. Um, that's a win you know you don't need to go to a lawsuit but geico requires it almost every time because they just refuse to negotiate and you know that could be something to do with geico's uh policies it could have something to do with geico's uh fiscal health i don't know but i i guarantee they they spend less on attorneys if they negotiated fairly and they just don't so back to the book is it did you, so several questions. Did you write the book yourself? Yeah. Are you doing like an Amazon self-published? Yeah, I'm going to do an Amazon self-published. Um, again, it's it's not all the way written yet, so that's that's a, a down-the-road thing to, to get to. But um, it's going to be provided for free to every one of my clients. Um, so if you're someone who's been injured in a, in a car accident, been a, a victim of a car accident, you're going to get a copy of this book for free when you sign up with me. Um, and it's going to outline a lot of the things that that we tell you when we're working with you, which is your social media is going to be monitored by the insurance company. Everything you post, uh, your your gym swipes when you're a member of L.A. Fitness or 24 hour fitness, when you badge in all the camera footage, all of that, they'll be able to get every bit of that information and use it against you. Is it crazy? So that people, is it crazy that people think that's their privacy, right? Yeah, like, it's there's like not think, like I don't care if your pub, Facebook's private, right? No, you still find out. It, 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 it's insane to me. The the insurance companies have billions of dollars at their disposal to minimize the value of your case. And if you have a significant other who's publicly posting pictures of you at the gym, even though you're not swiping in, even though you're not posting them, they're gonna find them. And they're going to use those to minimize the value of their claim. And if that gets put in front of a jury, it's going to have an impact, you know, and what your body was like before the accident, what your body is like after the accident and how you might have been a professional bodybuilder and you're just trying to stay in shape and and the mental health issues that go along with um, being someone who's physically active on a regular basis and then the depression that comes along with stopping that physical activity, it can be catastrophic for people. But that's an argument I'd love to not have to make for you by just not posting on social media. Just don't give them any ammunition to use against you. So what's, what's the purpose of the book? Is it like to give back to the community, uh, bring new customers in, just share knowledge? 
I just want to share knowledge. I think that any personal injury attorney will agree with the the facts in my book. Defense attorneys, you know, insurance defense attorneys, they could read this book and say, I, none of this is new information for us. But I think it's it's very basic new information for people who have not gone through the personal injury process or not gone through it with uh, an attorney or not gone through it and and thought, wow, maybe I left money on the table. You know, you gave this example of, of what if I got rear-ended and I just don't want to deal with it and I take 2,500 bucks, can I go back and, and get more later? I, Washington's minimum insurance policy limits are $25,000. And at my firm, we gauge success based on if we get that $25,000. If we settled your case for $2,500, I'd say, wow, we did not do a good service for our client. We don't deserve to take attorney's fees for this. Uh, our goal is to maximize the value of what your claim is. And if that means helping you to understand how your claim is valued, and it's valued based on how much medical treatment you did, and if your medical treatment is diagnostic to make sure you don't have more injuries or soft tissue treatment, which is massage and chiropractic and PT, where you're going to have to take time off of work to go do that, but you're going to feel better. And that's the medical treatment that the insurance company is responsible for paying for for you. Why wouldn't you do it if that's also going to increase the damages that you've, um, the value that the insurance company places on your, on your case? Go do the massages. Massages feel good. Your back will feel better. Go do the chiropractic care. Your back will feel better. And the insurance company will say, this case is worth more money to us now. Here's more money. But like, don't they have to pay for that up front? Like, who can afford to pay for massages and medical stuff and chiropractors up front, right? That's a great question. You don't have to pay for that stuff up front. When you're in a motor vehicle accident, every one of these treatment providers is going to know they're going to get paid on the back end. And if you have personal injury protection, they get paid out of the personal injury protection part of your insurance. That's $10,000 that you have for medical treatment set aside for you. But, but the insurance companies benefit from people not understanding how insurance works. You know, you say, I just need the minimum policy. Just sign up for the minimum policy. You know, every dollar that I'm spending on insurance is a dollar less I have for rent or utilities. And you think about it like a bill until you need it. And so if you have the ability to review your insurance policies, look at my book and say, what do I need to pay for? What makes sense? If I have kids and I'm traveling with my wife and my kids in my car, do I just have the minimum policy or should I be paying for more insurance? And, um, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time shit talking insurance companies, but that's not because insurance isn't important. It's because insurance companies want to take your money and then not let you use your benefits when you need them. And so if you, if you have the capacity to spend money on UIM coverage, which stands for uninsured motorist coverage, there's an incredible amount of drivers in Washington state who are driving without any insurance How is that coverage. Even allowed? It's not allowed, but the ticket is $550, and that's only if you get caught. So basically you're playing like uninsured motorist poker or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you're playing. You're I guess playing. as long as you don't speed whatever or draw attention to yourself, you're good. And then if you crash into someone, you get a $550 ticket, but the person you crashed into might have catastrophic injuries, and if they don't have UIM coverage, it's like they didn't have insurance. So the person who hits you has zero coverage. They get a ticket for 550 bucks. You're dealing with broken bones or whatever you're dealing with. And if you don't have UIM coverage, you're out of luck. There's no one that can help you recover money for your injuries. So how do you deal with this situation, right? Suppose you have a client, and I'm making this all up, of course. Like, it, it, you know, the client, you, you think, no, I can't tell you exactly, but I think we get you like $100,000, right? And then the client comes back, hey, you know, I, the insurance company called me. And they said, yeah, I, I probably won $100,000, but it's going to take like five years, right? I don't have five years to wait, so I'm going to take this $10,000 off of me now. Like, how do you like, convince clients, like, have patience, you know, even though they might not have patience? Well, there is absolutely a, a calculation. You know, my, my undergrad, I, I have a business background, and, and you know, we talk, talked about that with the, the venues that I started and, and my background. Um, I went to University of Washington, did business as my undergrad, and I got an MBA, and I've got a business law certification from my law school, and I've always just been a business-minded person. So there's absolutely part of that calculus that some people understand, some people don't, of the time value of money. 
And a million dollars six years from now might not be worth a million dollars when it's six years from now. And so what's that time value of money? What's that calculation worth right now today? And what I tell my clients who are concerned about that time frame and the path that it's going to take to get that value out of their claim is if you go to an insurance company and you say, I want money right now, they're going to discount what the value is right now because you're coming at them from a, a position of weakness. You're telling them, I need money right now. If you come at them a month from now from a position of strength, the value of what their negotiations are going to be is going to be completely different. But you don't know what a position of strength looks like without negotiating with an attorney because you don't do this as a profession. So it doesn't make sense for you to call an insurance company on your own and say, hey, 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 let's just let's close the deal. I had a broken arm. You pay my medical bills. Give me 10,000 bucks. That sounds like a lot of money. They're paying your medical bills and giving you $10,000. I'm positive. If you have a broken bone and you're getting $10,000 plus your medical bills, the insurance company is high-fiving as soon as they hang up the phone because that is not a, a reasonable settlement for what your damages are worth. So follow question. Like, hope I said this right. Like, suppose, like, suppose you have those, uh, you know, a rich person, poor person, right? A rich person has an accident. They're gonna probably know ten thousand dollars. This ain't correct. This is no money at all. Yeah. Well, poor people, you know, like kind of like struggling every day, yeah. making minimum wage, ten thousand dollars. That's a lot of fucking money. Yeah. How do you convince them? The you know, quote unquote economic disadvantaged person, like no, no person. Hey, like, do better for yourself, so to speak. This is actually a really good uh, uh, analysis to to have when you when we look at who actually goes through the process of a personal injury claim overwhelmingly it's not rich people overwhelmingly it's people who are out of luck um getting to their job and have to go through this process someone who was in a minor fender bender and, and might be dealing with soft tissue injuries if you're a millionaire you're not you, you're already getting massages whenever you want them you're you, this is uh, more of an inconvenience than the money is worth to go through a claim. Rich people don't hire personal injury attorneys. Middle class people and disadvantaged people do. And more often we see those same people who are starting these claims be taken advantage of by insurance companies because English is their second language or because the value of $10,000 in their hand right now is so much help for what they're going through that they say, how can an attorney get me even more? It's impossible that I need that money right now in my bank account today. But when you understand that an attorney is going to more than double what you would get working without an attorney, you say, oh, well, I'm going to get more money and not have to do this work alone, not have to do the, the research on what my injuries are worth or what who who needs to help me pay for my car to get fixed and who's going to help me get a rental car and all of the things that are associated with going through this injury, you start to say, wow, this is, this is worth it just for the peace of mind. Um, I think an, another point to that is people don't know that if you take time off of work or you miss work or you have to use sick pay or vacation pay, all of that, the insurance company has to pay you. That is a completely separate wage loss claim that you're entitled to. But people say, I can't miss work. I can't miss work to go do my treatment. I, I don't have the ability to, to take time off. Well, that's going to be really hard for an insurance company to value your claim then if they know that they're valuing your claim based on the amount of your medical bills. And so if you don't have medical bills, they're not going to value your claim. So go get the treatment that you need for your body to be better or the diagnostic care and, and preventative you know, uh, assurance that you need to make sure that you're not more injured. Go to the urgent care and get checked out right after the accident. And if you don't have health insurance, understand that an attorney is going to be able to um, create a solution that prevents you from being more out of luck for getting the health care that you need. But what if a person is saying they can't leave work because they know they're going to fire? Like the boss doesn't care about you. I don't care about your accent or whatever. I pay you $20 an hour to do this nine to five. You're gonna, if you're not here, you're going to fire. How, how, how about those situations? 
Luckily, I've not had anyone call me and say that exact sentence because that's a no-win situation, right? Like if you have a boss who says, I don't give a shit that you were in a car accident, get your ass to work, and you don't get to miss work to go do the treatment that you need, that's a tough situation. Luckily, a lot of these treatment providers understand that if they were only open nine to five, a lot of people wouldn't be able to get to treatment. So they're open later than that. They're open on Saturdays. You know, you can still get treatment that you need. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of finding the right treatment provider. So um, we have a lot of doctors that we've worked with over the years that do a great job. We have some doctors that we, we don't enjoy working with, but um, a lot of times it's just based on what's nearby your house or nearby your work that's convenient. Maybe you can go on your lunch break and get a massage. Maybe you can go on a lunch break and get your chiropractic adjustment. And if you can't miss work, um, that's an that's an option for you. But but there are always solutions, and everybody's situation is totally different. Um, and you just need someone to help you. And that's what it comes down to is is you wouldn't you wouldn't try to build a, a plane on your own. You know, you need you need a team of people working together to build a plane. You wouldn't trust yourself to build a plane and then go fly it off a cliff. Why would you trust yourself? I don't know. Some of these airlines need to do stuff going off. That oh, boat, flying that, off. We'll man, fly off. Uh, I I got to I got to fly Alaska in like five days. I'm not looking forward to it. But um, don't sit at the exit door. Yeah, that's that's a whole other thing. But but that's what I'm saying. You know, it, even even professionals said, wow, they they can make mistakes. So understand that not all attorneys are created equally um but i would rather you be in a position to be working with a, a a shitty attorney than doing this on your own because the insurance companies want you to do it on your own and then if you're going to have an attorney they want you to have a shitty one who's just going to be motivated to resolve your case for pennies i just thought something that'd be really fucked up right like suppose i have an accident right now i'm gonna pass that on right and i, I have an accident tomorrow I call the insurance company and I say, you know what? I, you know what? I don't trust to get a lawyer. And they say, well, we can recommend a lawyer for you. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't think <laughs> I don't think they recommend any lawyers for you. They don't they don't want you to to use a lawyer at all. So rather than be, recommend be, one be, for be, you, be the own lawyer. Yeah, yeah. The, I think what they do is they say, well, you know, do what you need to do. But uh, what if what if I gave you five thousand bucks right now? Is that is that enough to get this across the finish line? You know. They're going to figure out, based on communications with you and the medical bills that you have, a way to try to prevent you from even talking to one. That's their job. But it's like, it's like you wouldn't go to criminal court without an attorney. You understand the pitfalls that are associated with that. That's exactly what they're doing. You know, if, if you're in a police interrogation, everyone knows you have the right to talk to an attorney. Why would you go through a, a negotiation with an insurance professional without that same representation to protect your interests? That's why we exist. No, I would never take the side of insurance company, but aren't there like people out there who are like their careers, like like have fake accidents, you know, like do stuff on purpose, you know, and like that kind of stuff? Uh, I've never had a case where someone made up a claim. I, I because because someone else had to have hit you <laughs> you know there's there's always it takes two to have these cases so if if you manufactured a case where you're like hey josh i'm gonna be driving on i-5 at midnight uh why don't you come rear end me so i can make a couple bucks you're making that money from my insurance so uh, why would i agree to that <laughs> you know there's there's no there's no benefit to me to agree to do that because for then you your, then your premium goes up. yeah yeah and so um I, I, I think that that's propaganda put out by the insurance companies that, that they have people who have a, a, a history of faking it. That's, okay. just, that's just people uh, in positions that, that they have media attention and, and, and papers created by professionals that are, oh, we did a study on how many insurance claims are faked. That's just bullshit. Okay. People don't go through this process unless they're hurt. Right. People don't go through all of the work to open a claim and do all the treatment if they're not if they're not actually benefiting from that treatment they would just go back to their regular life this is not some you know million dollar payday for them this is not winning the lottery you have to do the work to go through this process and this process is long and painful and 
you know, it can be invasive. An insurance company doing a deposition of our clients is never a fun thing for our clients to go through. So if the insurance company is doing the bare minimum to do their job, our clients are going to say, damn, I don't know if I want to go to trial. And it's our job to say, well, here's, here's your options. Here's the benefit of negotiations right now. Here's the benefit of going to trial and putting this in front of a jury or, or an arbitration where you're putting it in front of a judge to, to make that decision. But depositions are painful for most people. And they ask you embarrassing questions and they try to do those aha moments where they pull up footage of your uh, gym swipes and all that stuff and, and make you want to falter, make you, make you feel nervous. And an experienced attorney, like, like you just asked me, is how do you get around that? You say, well, in spite of their injuries, this person endured. This person tried to get back to their activities of daily living as best they could. And that's how you get around that. But a bad attorney isn't going to know how to get around it and say, hey, man, they got some shit on you. You, you better settle right now. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just that's not what we do over here at Brumley Law Firm. We're ready to take it to the box. So we'll go back to law firm in a minute, but moving on to something else. Talk about, do you still do this thing called 100 for, for Haiti? Uh, I was super involved with 100 for Haiti for a long time. Greg Benick is a very close friend of mine. He's the founder of 100 for Haiti. I was a treasurer for a number of years. Still, um, still love talking to Greg about what he's doing. That was his baby. And uh, after the earthquake in, gosh, I can't remember what year that was. Didn't they have like two in one year or two? Yeah, it was back -back? really, really two, bad. Yeah. And um, Greg... Greg had no connections with Haiti, but he just, he flew there. He was just a, a local Seattle guy who said, how can I help? And he just took it upon himself to fly there, make connections with aid organizations and say directly to a doctor in Haiti, what do you need most? And they said, rice. And he said, okay, I'm going to go back to Seattle. I'm going to fundraise and I'm going to charter a boat that has rice on it to you. And he did. And then after that, it was like, what else do you need? And they were like, we need you know, basic medical supplies. Can you get us basic medical supplies and clean water? And he said, okay. And he came back to Seattle and he, he started doing shows with other punk bands. And he's, he's a, a wonderful guy that just took it upon himself to say, how can I fix a problem that I see in the world? And that was just so exhilarating to see someone else who, who just had that like can-do attitude that I've always had just going out into the community and saying, how can I help fix a problem that people have? And um, so I said, Greg, how can I help? And he said, dude, I don't understand taxes. How can you, how can you help me with tax stuff? And I said, got you, dude. Um, and, and so, yeah, Greg, Greg was just the keynote speaker for a big uh, lawyer event that, that I was involved in called the Sharky Awards. And he talked about 100 for Haiti and, and um, I, I just, I love seeing that kind of energy. I love, putting people like that on a pedestal to, to help get the word out that, that there are people who just hear about uh, a, a tragedy, hear about a problem of the, in the world and say, uh, I'm just one person, but I think I can help. And, and you know, a lot of people are overwhelmed with how many problems there are in the world and they want to make social media posts about what they'd like to do and stop this and don't do that. And and that's all it ever is, is social media presence. But that's not what it is for people like Greg. And, and I hope that that's how people perceive me, is, is I see a problem. I try my best to go out and be part of a solution. Yeah. And then Haiti's not that far from, like, Florida, right? Isn't like like, an hour flight or something? Uh, like I've never right? been. I've never been. So I don't know how far the flight is. But it's it's not an incredible uh, distance and and even if it was, you know, it's it's about people. It's it's just about the humanity of people were suffering. People shouldn't be suffering. And what can I do to fix that? Not what should the world be doing? Not should what the president should be doing? Not what should Starbucks be doing? But what can I do yeah. right now today? And he flew there. He made connections. And he said, what do you need to help people? And he ended up buying motorcycles so that these doctors could get around to, to do uh, medical treatment in these remote areas that didn't have access for full cars. And it's just, it, it's incredible. The The story of, of 100 for Haiti is, is super heartwarming. You should have Greg Benick on your show. It's still going on. He's still oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's never going to stop. The thing about Haiti, like, 
one thing that I, one of my pet peeves about like America is oh the country's bad. We're like poor. We're really horrible. Like people are hating. Like they've they've lost been fucked for a while, right? They'd yeah. be like, I mean, right now I think gangs are running this like Haiti, right? It's like corruption. It's like military juntas, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's like that's that's a whole other that's a whole other conversation, right? It, what what country doesn't have their problems? But Greg Greg doesn't make it about government issues or gang violence or anything like that. He says. I'm going to make connections to people that I believe I could send actual money or supplies to to do good. Mm -hmm. And that's what he does. Nice, nice. So you brought up the 2023, it's called Sharky Attorney Award. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, 2023 was the first year of the award ceremony. Um, it was intended to encourage other attorneys. I, I, I know a lot of attorneys being in this industry. I know a lot of young attorneys being in this industry. I know a lot of old attorneys being in this industry. And and w one common thing that I saw, you know, my background in, in punk and hardcore music is being really community focused. And that's something that this industry or the business world, for example, not incredibly value. Uh, these industries don't value that type of community engagement. You know, um, and so I said, well, how can I make it something that these people care about? How can how can we create uh, this idea that community engagement when you're a lawyer is important? And so that award ceremony was born from that idea. It was, you know, how can we encourage young attorneys who are also entrepreneurs so they have this second hat? You're not just an attorney who works for other people. You're an attorney who also has to manage staff and run a law firm and, and do all the work that's associated with being a business owner. But on top of both of those things, you're still actively giving back to the community in some form or fashion. And so um, whether that means volunteering time to a clinic or being involved with other nonprofit entities or putting on Know Your Rights clinics or whatever these other attorneys were doing that, that um, made them... Uh, a Sharky Award recipient. It was. It was. There's no limit to the number of attorneys who can win this award. It is how many attorneys are actually putting the time in to do that work. Any attorney, any person can donate money. Money is easy, but uh, organizations like Tacoma Pro Bono and these other nonprofit agencies, they don't exist without people doing work. And when you're an attorney and you have deadlines and your own caseload, it's easy to, to forget about anything else. And it's easy when you're a business owner to forget about anything else. But when, you, when you're a person who cares about community, it's, it's not something you forget about. And those attorneys deserve to be spotlighted and, and rewarded for that type of behavior. And um, that's what the Sharkies seek to do every year. So why do you think most Average Americans have negative, you know, stereotypes about lawyers, you know. Um, and how, how do we overcome that? The lawyers are, are a good part of it. I think lawyers are needed in society, right? Oh, yeah. I think, I think if, so, you, if, you're, if you have a healthy distrust of government, then you don't dislike lawyers. I think why people dislike lawyers is, uh, I, I'm not, where are you from originally? Texas. Texas. In Texas, is every billboard a lawyer billboard? <laughs> because in Florida, every billboard is a lawyer billboard. And in Georgia, every billboard is a lawyer billboard. And what gets to be the problem is when lawyers are so aggressively marketing themselves that you're annoyed by it. That's not, that's not good for the world. That's just, it drowns people out and, and puts people off and that's like the idea of like ambulance chasing, right? Like an attorney who's so hungry for business that he will follow an ambulance to a hospital just to give his business card to someone who's in a hospital bed and say, please hire me, I'll help you. That's not know your rights. That is aggressively targeting injured people to encourage business for yourself. Um, that's why people dislike attorneys because they don't want to be aggressively targeted by anyone. They don't want to be aggressively marketed at. But our generation of social media and 
instant gratification when you need access to information. It changed things a lot. And so I think younger people are going to be more excited to have attorneys um, accessible. And you're not accessible because you're on a billboard. You know, that's that's not that's not what makes you an accessible person to a young person who, who's used to that instant gratification. You, you're accessible because you have access to a community and or in a community, you're, you're a part of a community. And so when people know you, when you're doing things like speaking on podcasts and making personal connections, that's the value that lawyers can bring to a community and being a resource is really important. And like you said, attorneys are incredibly important. You think about any terrible, um, terrible situation in, in world history. Lawyers are some of the first people to get uh, uh, taken out, I guess, is, is, is the best way to put it. If, if people understand their legal rights and the government or uh, uh, an entity who's trying to go around those legal rights can't do what they're trying to do. So lawyers are the first line of defense against people being taken advantage of. And if there are not lawyers, then people don't know what their rights are and governments or police or any of these entities who might benefit from doing terrible things can do those terrible things with without recourse. When did you know you want to become a lawyer? How did that process start and work out? You know, it was a, it was a real gradual thing. Um, I I didn't wake up as a kid and say, "Man, I love Matlock. I really want to wear that white suit." Um, I I think that the idea of lawyers just being super fancy and the the TV shows like Suits that glorify like Manhattan style contract negotiation is it's just like a joke. That's not what lawyering is. I think more often. Uh, people resonate with a regular person who's a lawyer as well. And if you're good at your job, no matter what your job is, people will gravitate towards you because you're good at your job. And if you're good at your job, the results speak for themselves and it doesn't matter what that job is. And so for me, it was like, I knew that being a lawyer would help me to help people. And I didn't know what kind of lawyer I wanted to be, whether I was going to be a family law lawyer, a criminal defense a, a lawyer, or personal injury attorney, attorney like I am now, the, the goal was just how can I best help people? And so even after law school, I wasn't sure, and it didn't matter because I couldn't help people right out of law school to, to do a good job on stuff. I had to go learn how to be a lawyer, and I learned that from attorneys that were more experienced than me and said, well, what do I perceive them doing right? What are they teaching me? And what do I perceive them doing that I would do differently? And, and put my own flavor on everything that these attorneys taught me and said, here's how I do it now. And I've been incredibly successful, thankfully. Does it matter what law school you graduate from as far as like being a good lawyer, a great lawyer, or, you know, it, all the money you might make as a lawyer? No, I, you know, I know Stanford educated folks and Harvard educated folks. And I think, um, and, and I know plenty of people who, who went to fourth tier, which is the, the lowest tier of law school, um, law schools that have lost their accreditation after these people graduated. And, uh, I don't think that matters. I don't think it matters. Law school prepares someone to take the bar exam and it changes the way your mind works and it changes hopefully your work ethic um, people can't get through law school with the same priorities they had in undergrad and the same work ethic they had in undergrad it's a whole other ball game and so if you are a hard worker and you get through law school it does not matter what law school you went to I think it matters what your work ethic is after law school's over and after you've passed that bar exam. And do you still have that fire to go learn and to go work and to go be the best person that is in that courtroom? Um, when you're a young attorney, you're against, 
you're you're physically matched up against attorneys who have been potentially practicing law since before you were born. That is a, a huge overwhelming thought, but that doesn't matter because they didn't choose which side they were representing. They have their client, you have your client, and your job is to represent your client to the best possible ability that you have. And if that means you didn't sleep last night because you were researching case law and you were trying to understand what their arguments were going to be and how to counter those arguments, that's what being a lawyer is about. It's, it's mental chess. It's, it's debate. It's argument. It's, it's how can you be the best version of the attorney that needs to represent that client. In law school, do they teach you how to run a small business? I'm guessing the answer is no. Not at all. No. Not so is this like not even one class I took in law school was about small business. Okay. Yeah, but I, I did a dual degree program where I got my MBA while I was in law school. So I did business school at night while I was in law school during the day. Um and and my business undergrad honestly was probably the best place that I learned how to to run a business. But I've always been kind of like a business minded person. And I think that um, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit is something that's innate in people and not in other people. And so if you're not a business person, it's okay to help someone else grow something and to be the most important number two person in a business. I think it's, it's a, a falsely glorified idea that being an entrepreneur is a good thing. It's incredibly risky. If you have a family to take care of, it's probably not the best thing for you because there were months that went by when I was building this business that I couldn't take a paycheck at all. And your employee's pay has to come before yours. And that's not something that people want to risk. People would much rather say, my job is nine to five. And at five, I clock out and I go, but I'm never clocked out. I'm, I'm never off the clock. Nope. So... I think there's a strip out there, like a lawyer, like, like you're talking, talking about Matlock, Perry Mason, L.A. Law. Those suits guys. Yeah, the suits guys, you know, all the sexiness, you know, the lawyer in the courtroom defending the person. But in reality, is it like maybe like 2% sexy and 98% like doing like mind-numbing, boring research? Well, I don't think any of it is not sexy. I think even the mind-numbing research is sexy, but that's because I just really love what I do. And I think a lot of people desire the spotlight more than they desire doing the work to get in the spotlight. But I don't, I, I would feel gross uh, pretending that I was the best attorney in the state when I know that I'm not. And that's okay that I'm not the best attorney in the state. I don't need to be the best attorney in the state. I need to be the best attorney that I can be every single day. And every day that I make a mistake, I need to learn from that mistake and do better the next day. And that's all anyone can do. But where I think I excel um, and where I stand apart from other people is, is the work ethic and time that I put into everything that I do. And other people, for whatever reason, might not have that time. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch up. I'm going to catch up on years of experience because of what I'm doing and what I'm learning every single night, every single weekend. I'm always working, baby. And no one, no one will work harder than me. So extreme case. Suppose there's one lawyer, like he knows case law, like like the back of his hand, right? He he's the law expert, right? Mm -hmm. But he's not the best public speaker. Mm -hmm. Someone else is like kind of iffy on law, not the best knowledge or facts, but he's a freaking showman, right? Yeah. Which one should you pick? Find a firm that you'll get both because um, I, I, you know, that's a really funny thing that you say. And I hope that the attorney that I work with um, doesn't take this the wrong way. I think I'm a showman. I think I've always been a public speaker. And I think that I have lots to learn about the law. And I think that the benefit of working with Brian at my firm is that he is always going to know more about the case law than I know. Not always, maybe, you know, 10 years from now, I'll, I'll catch up to him. But that guy is, he's, he's got it locked in. And I think he enjoys public speaking and I think he's good at it, but I think that his true strength and how we're so yin and yang for each other at, at, at my business is 
I could walk into a courtroom and he could hand me an argument 15 minutes before and say, this is what you need to discuss. And I would feel confident doing that, delivering that argument, being that showman and being persuasive in a way that a jury or a judge would understand our argument in its most basic logical form. But that's because I have background as a public defender and as playing in bands and stuff like that. When you're a public defender, you're sometimes handed a case 15 minutes before you have to go in front of the judge and argue about it. You have to be able to soak up the key points, talk to your client, get the key points out of them when they will maybe want to tell you their whole life story and you have to politely shut that down and say, I don't need your whole life story right now. I need to make a bail argument right now. And in order for me to help you the best way that I can, I need to know if you're working right now. And if you were taken to jail from this hearing, would you lose your job? Are you taking care of people right now? If you were taken to jail right now from this hearing, would those people not be able to be taken care of? Those are the arguments I need to make right now. We'll have plenty of time to get into the merits of why you're here after today. But we're not going to get into that right now. I need to know the details that I need to know to make the argument that I need to make. And when you break things down in a really bite-sized way like that to people, they understand it. And when I'm working on uh, personal injury cases, I try really hard to break things down in a bite-sized way so you understand what your role is in this process and you understand what I'm doing. And if you don't hear from me for 30 days, it's not because I'm not working on your case. It's because I'm working really hard on your case and you already know what I'm doing. So how does it work? Like, suppose you have a case, right? Is there times where, like, you go, you have a judge, like, oh, shit, this judge is, like, not friendly. He's anti-whatever. Can you, like, like, I don't say dismiss it, just like go somewhere and say, hey, I want a new judge based yeah. on his previous whatever. Yeah, yeah you can. Um, you can affidavit a judge. You can ask the judge to be kicked off. You know, there's, um, there's a judge that was in Tacoma Municipal Court for a long time that everyone in the public defender's office would affidavit because he was a former prosecutor. <laughs> and... Uh, Someone would get in trouble after their case was closed, so they'd get ordered to come in for a review hearing where, hey, you were supposed to stay out of trouble, you got a new charge, now you're in trouble from the old case as well as the new case. So this review hearing was about the old case and, and the rule that you're supposed to stay out of trouble. So this judge would, would uh, sentence everyone to like the high end of their maximum sentence separate from their new charge just for being in trouble again. And the public defender's office was seeing that so frequently from this judge that they all collectively were like, let's just all affidavit this judge. He needs to understand this is not okay. And um, I'm not in criminal law anymore. I'm not sure if that judge is even a sitting judge anymore, but um, there, there are absolutely options that are available to make sure that you get a fair shot in any court. After you finished law school, did you go straight into your own business or you worked for someone else first? I actually worked for the Social Security Administration because right after law school, I, I come from a family that did not have means. And so I had to put myself through, excuse me, I had to put myself through undergrad. I had to put myself through law school. And that took a lot of loan money and um, work on my end. And I was really nervous, you know, borrowing so much money, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get through law school. Um, I was really nervous how I was going to ever pay that money back. And I knew that if I was going to invest in anything in the world, um, investing in myself was the best choice. You know, people invest in stocks and bonds and all this stuff, Bitcoin, and they try to make, make themselves rich overnight. And I said, all that seems like a scam to me. I, I'm not going to gamble. I'm going to say, I know if I'm putting this money into myself that it's going to pay dividends. I just need to create the path that that's not there for me. And so that was college for me. And um, when I when I took these loans out and, and went through law school, I said, okay, well, how do I get these loans forgiven? What's the process for that? And if you work for a government agency or a nonprofit for 10 years, then your loans can be automatically forgiven. And I said, okay, well... I don't know what I'm going to want to do outside of law school when I, when I become an attorney. So I need to just find any job that qualifies for that and then make my next move after I've started banking these maybe first few months or a year or two years. 
maybe I like that job, maybe I don't, but at least I didn't work somewhere that didn't qualify for that loan forgiveness. So uh, it was about efficiency, and I worked for the Social Security Administration for one calendar year almost to the day, and I absolutely fucking hated it. Every single day I would show up to work, and I would, I would try. I, I know that other people feel this feeling, but you know when you get to a job you hate, and you're like, okay, just don't look at the clock, don't look at the clock, don't look at the clock. Try as hard as you can not to look at the clock. And one second has passed. And you look at the clock and you're like, how the fuck is it 9.15? Oh my God, it's been hours that I've been sitting here. It's exactly. only 9.15. Yeah. That was my okay. experience working for Social Security every single day. And I was excited to learn about Medicare benefits and Social Security benefits and, and how to help people and and what it's like when someone passes away, how you put in a death report when you're working for Social Security and get their benefits shut off so that there's not fraud and all these other things. But the people that I worked with uh, perpetuated the idea that that job was soul crushing and they had been there for maybe like 20 years and I was the new guy on the block and they were like, this is just how it is, man. Every day is like this. And I was not a good employee i was constantly on my cell phone and hated being there and my boss would come by and say dude you have to get off your phone and i'd say yeah sorry and i'd turn it over and then she'd walk away and then i'd turn it right back over and get right back on it because i was like who cares if i even get fired from this job it'll force me to find something that i actually care about but it was it was really sad because i didn't enjoy being a shitty employee i just didn't enjoy what i was doing i was so unhappy with what i was doing and that idea of being a bad employee and being on my cell phone, that has helped me be a good employer, I think, um, a good boss, um, a good business owner, because I see that in some of my staff historically. And I sit down and I say, are you unhappy here? If you don't like this job, if you're not passionate about this job, I do not want you to come in. I do not want you to work here. I want people who are as energized about what I'm doing to help people's lives as I am. And if that's not you, it's okay. I'll write you a great recommendation. Your work that you've performed thus far has been great. It's not about me firing you or you quitting. It's about having a conversation with another human being who's obviously unhappy. If this job is not making you happy, don't waste your time being here. It's not good for me. It's not a favor to me as, as a boss. It's not a favor to you. And I've had that conversation more times than I can count trying to get to the staff that I have now. And people really respect that. And they say, hey man, yeah, I fucking hate this job, but this is not what I expected I'd be doing every day. And uh, I think I need to leave. And I'd say, great, let me know when your last day is gonna be. And let me know what I can do to help you find a job that you're actually gonna give a shit about. And people respect that. And that's not something that that kind of respect is, is common in a lot of, um, a lot of jobs and especially not in the legal industry. I think a lot of lawyers are like petulant little babies where they say, you're going to quit on me. You're going <laughs> to, you, you don't want to work here after all I've done for you. And that's not a great way to make people feel. And, and I don't want to feel like humans are just resources. You know, the idea of human resources, think about that concept. Yeah. That's so sad. These are human beings that have families that they want to take care of and they have to work and they don't want to be here. And sometimes they do. Sometimes they do really want to be there. And the staff that I have right now in my firm, I, I, I think about how lucky I am every day to have the staff that I have. I, every single person is energized about what we do, is excited to be there, um, would, would work on the weekends if that's what the work required, and hopefully it never does. But you know, sometimes that's what it requires when we're in trials or stuff like that. And these are the people that you want to be in the foxhole with when you're going to war you know, against these insurance companies. I don't want someone who's phoning it in. I don't want someone who's not excited to be there. I want someone who's ready to kick some ass and and get every penny that you can for the for the person that's injured and hired us. How many people are on, on your staff right now? I think we have about 13 or 13. 14. Yeah, yeah, 14 maybe. Um, and that, that's a great uh, segue into the questions I wanted to ask you is, your background is HR, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so the idea of like 
being a small business owner, you don't have an HR person and, and a lot of businesses make a ton of HR type, uh, <laughs> kerfuffles. I don't know. What's a polite way of saying fuck up. Um, what, what are some of the things that you think small business owners should know about running a business, especially in Washington or in Seattle proper, you know, there's different laws that apply for minimum wage in Seattle. There's different laws that apply when you have a certain amount of employees. What, what are things that yeah. I should know or people that are listening should know? Yeah. So HR is different. It's okay. Like the state of Washington, Seattle is different. Tacoma. And then you have the rest of the state, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, not top politics, but usually the more liberal a place is, the more HR laws there is, right? For right. Example, Seattle, San Francisco, New York City, Austin, Texas, you know, have way more They want to protect yeah. workers. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of mistake. One thing is like, whatever your take on immigration is, I don't care if you want illegal immigration or you know, against it, if you hire someone, you have, they have to prove to you they can work in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. We're through like, those like our passport, ID card, whatever case may be. And if like, employee handbook, HR policies, a lot of people think, you know, Oh, it's to tell people what to do, compliance. No, it's really like show what kind of cards you have, right? Like, suppose you have an HR policy. One person has an HR policy that says, I only give you two days off of funerals. It can only be for mother and father, right? Or wife. Mm -hmm. Someone else has an HR policy. You can take 10 days off of funerals, and it's to be whoever you want to take time off for. Mm -hmm. You're going to work for, right? Yeah. And there's like no, um, something as simple as like, you know, how many days off are you going to give people for the case? 14 days. And then, like, are you going to let them carry it over, right? Mm -hmm. With me, I would say no, because like, suppose I work for you, right? You give me, say you give me 10 days of vacation per year. I work for five years. I take no vacation. Then I leave. You have to pay me other vacation when I leave, right? Yeah. Like what small business have the money for that, right? Right. Most don't, right? Yeah. And then, you know, what's that saying? Common sense is never common, right? Yeah. You know, you know, a lot of small business owners are like, this is the stuff they do is kind of insane, right? I had one person ask me, do I have to give like people time off for, you know, like federal holidays? Uh, actually, you don't, right? Mm. But who's going to work for you, right? Right, like, right. Can I give only people five days off? Yeah, but who's going to work for you? So if 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 that's two separate questions, right, the, the analysis is, do you want to be an employer that people want to work for, or do you want to understand what the laws are and then craft your business strategies around those laws? Obviously, people just don't even understand what the laws are. No. That's the sad part. So- yeah, absolutely. You should take that step of analysis to the next level of like, which employer do you want to be? Yeah. But understanding those laws is like the basic first step. And so if you're saying, no, you don't have to give paid time off for federal holidays. No, you don't have to let vacation pay carry over into the next year if you don't want to. No, you don't have to, you know, have a handbook. But don't you think a handbook is going to be the best way to understand what it's exactly. like to work at your business. Yeah. And so what do you recommend for people who don't have a handbook or who don't know what these laws are? I mean, like us at Captain's HR right now, we're like going on the MVP phase. We're actually like doing handbooks and HR policies at no cost for companies in Seattle for not fewer people. You, just, you just sign up with us. You see, send you a set of questions, answer the platform, the code like does your handbooks and policies for you, right? Just And the question only you can answer, right? I, I have people like, can you answer it for me? No, I can't answer a question for you, right? Yeah. I'm not in your business, right? You know, simple stuff like, you know, like, Holidays, time off, a welcome message, you know. You should probably have a welcome message. No, maybe not something that's corny. It's like, hey, come work for the greatest company ever, you know, but something, you know, yeah. like something like that, you know. And there's many ways to do it too, right? And, you know, the, the culture too, right? There's really no right or wrong culture. It's the culture that works for your company, right? But the thing is you have to tell people what your culture is, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe your culture is like, you know, for example, Amazon culture is one culture. Starbucks is completely different, right? Microsoft, you know, like if you work at Amazon, and go to Starbucks with the same mentality, you're probably not going to make it, right? Yeah, it's not going to be a successful transition because the culture is different. Yeah, just a lot of people you don't know you don't know, like 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 onboarding, right? People don't know this, like, suppose you hire me, right? You hire me on Monday. I have three days to prove to you I can work in the United States. That's the I-9 form. I-9 form, yeah. yeah. I have three days. Yeah. Of course, like, if I bring you, like, a expired, suppose my driver's, like, expired, I have a sheet saying, hey, I, you know, I, I applied for it, then, okay, give me a break, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. so many people will, like, get that wrong, you know? They don't even do an I-9, and they don't have an a no. HR program. They don't have an HR person that understands that yeah. you're, then, you're required to have this I-9. And, and then so many people just do stupid shit. Like, this happened a few years ago. I had a friend, right? She was a female. So she was a software developer. She got laid off for one job, and she was without working three or four months, and she got an interview, right? Passed the phone, passed the Zoom, had an in-person interview. She walked in, five guys. She walked in. They're like, like one of the people, oh, we didn't know you were pregnant. 
this is not going to work out because obviously, you know, we're a startup. We need to somebody totally committed. You're going to give me a kid. Or we're sorry to apologize your time. Damn, that's a lawsuit right there. Yeah. yeah. That's a lawsuit. But people do this all the time, right? It's like, <clears throat> man, like, what are you doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really. And, and then like, so many stuff people get confused to, like, you know, the drug free policy, right? People think drug free policy means like you have to do drug testing on and on. Drug free policy is really only for, you know, if you have a $100,000 more contract with the federal government. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you're like a private employer, now, of course, you're morally opposed to drugs, all that kind of stuff, but there's not, nothing saying you have to have a drug free policy for mm -hmm. a private company, unless you're doing contracts that federal government home with $100,000. So if I run a law firm and I want to encourage my staff to not come to work effed up on drugs, it, it makes sense for me to have a drug free yeah, policy. You, 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 more than, what's that drug free policy entail? Like, what are the requirements for it, having a drug free policy? There's really none, you know, in your situation, right? You can okay. say, you know, you can be like, hey, before you get hired, you have to take a drug test. You're going to say, you know, take the drug test for marijuana, cocaine, heroin, and fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, every six months, you might get a pop of drug test. It just, so every better scenario is like that. Suppose, like, suppose you have a donor shop, right? Now, if you're the cashier at the donor shop, does it really matter if you smoke dope? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, right? Probably not. But let's suppose you're the baker of donuts and you're hiring coke or fentanyl and you burn that shit down. Yeah. As far as HR, Maybe not with the interest in a care, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of things like people get like things are HR related, but also interest related too, you know. So if if you're running a business, is it possible to uh, have different policies for different levels of employees, or should they all be uniform? That's a great question. I would say no. I know a lot of people do that. You know, like you know, do you have different policies for you no know, salaried or versus hourly workers? You know, because you know, unfortunately, whether it's good or bad, a lot of people like give like more stuff that are, you know, you know, salary employees, right? Like salary employees, you know, like come and go as they please sometimes, you know, all these workers want to kind of like micromanage, you know? Yeah. So that's a great question, right? It's, it's I want to say it depends, but it's like, you want to be fair, but then it's like, you know, like, yeah, that's, that's, that's a tough one to be honest with you. Okay. Okay. So then the, the goal would be to just make one uniform decision that can, applies yeah. to everyone. If you can, yeah. Like dress code. I, I've had people ask about dress code too. Like, uh, I'm a very casual uh, employer, and I think that people's work speaks volumes. And if they provide good work, I could give a shit what they wore yeah. to work that day. But some of my management staff thinks it's important to be, you know, extremely presentable and and to dress to the nines as as much as possible. And um, they had a conversation with me where they were like, well, you're the, you're the boss, so you can wear whatever you want, but the rest of the staff needs to be wearing. Yeah, but then you send the wrong message, right? Right. You're like, you, right. Work, you work today, you're dressed up. Everyone else has to be a three-piece suit, right? Yeah, and I'm it's in like, my t-shirt, yeah, like, you know, sporting comeback kid. And then look at your side eyes, like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, yeah. Who wants to work for a boss who yeah. doesn't, you know, walk the walk? And across the culture, too, like, you know, I think, you know, if, you know, if you hire somebody, okay, Wherever you want to, we don't care. Or, hey, we have to be like slacks and tea, tea, whatever case may be, as long as you're consistent, right? You can't mm -hmm. be like one policy for another person, right? So it's consistency. Think consistency it's, right it's, now. it's the same as that drug test policy where you're yeah, all making that, the same. Oh, it's crazy. Like, you these companies, like, it could be cows for Friday. All that really means is you don't have to wear a tie that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we do casual Friday at Brumley Law Firm, but you get a Brumley Law Firm t-shirt for free that you get to sport, and we give a, a bunch of them out. We yeah. have a lot of cool designs. And that thing, another thing people mess up too, though, for me, there's a difference between fair and equal, right? Suppose you have two people working for you, and everything, you know, they both work 20 hours an hour, right? Both doing the same job. One person is like, comes to work a few minutes early, always like, you say, hey, have you done this? Oh. I've already done it right. Mm -hmm. You have someone out to help people out like this. The A player. A player, right? Yeah. The other person, you know, comes to work, you know, 10 minutes late with breakfast, does that work to 9.30, you know. Hey, can someone help? They're like, pew, gone, yeah. you know. Yeah. The work is really like, no, not. They don't answer text messages yeah. when it's their day off. Even if it's an emergency, yeah. they're like, it's my day off. Uh, their average are best, right? At the end of the year, you give them both a raise of $25. Is that equal? Yes. I guarantee one person is going to say this is not fair. Yeah. And so many people do that shit, right? And so you recommend that uh, in those situations, the the fair practice is the better practice yeah. because you'll retain the A player. Exactly. And who cares if you don't retain the exactly. C player? Because what happens, that C player is not someone who's what dedicated in the to the business. The A player is going to leave because I'm not appreciated. You're stuck with the C player. The C player, man, I got a $5 raise and I'm doing shit. 
and keep on doing this. And yeah. before you know, your, your company's gone to shit. Yeah, yeah. That's not a great way to run a business. But how do you how do you spot C players if they're not as obvious as like, you know, showing up 30 minutes late with Starbucks? I mean, day? it's tough, right? I mean, you have to, I mean, every business has some kind of metrics, right? I think, right? It has to be some kind of measure, measure you know, like even like just, just someone that's doing sales for you, like how many sales they close, you know, or like. Yeah. So KPIs, KPIs, metrics. yeah, some kind of PI. It has to be some kind of PI. I mean, maybe there's some business that have that, you know, like, I was like, you know, if you're doing customer service and, you know, customer service always has complaints for one person, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, I mean, and plus, too, another thing, too, like in HR, people say hire fast and hire, you know, hire slow, fire fast. Yeah. So I'm not saying, I don't believe in hire slow because, like, I'm not saying, like, you know, hire someone the first time you meet them, but, like, do you need 10 interviews? Yeah, yeah, you know, no, that's obnoxious. and Because and... the only way you know someone's going to work after you actually work with them, right? Exactly. And people then, put on a, a facade both when they're in do. that interview The company and, and the employee. And, but then they start hard, fire fast. No one fires fast. Uh, it's, it's their birthday. It's Christmas. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't feel like dealing with Jason, right? It's, yeah. You know, before you know it, six months have passed. And when you're coming, it's like, what the fuck is Jason doing? Yeah. Like, and then, I, how and does then not morale has been affected by Jason being a C player and getting away with it yep. for six months. Yep. And now everyone who was an A player says, why am I going to stay at a business that's failing? Or oh, why be an A player? Yeah, why be an A player here? Um, I, I think that's really, really a key component of understanding like uh, being a good business owner because I see small business owners who reward hard work with more work. Oh, yeah, I talked about that's, podcasts one day, yeah. That's so sad. That's the opposite of what you're supposed to do. If if someone's not performing and someone is overperforming, mm -hmm. moving the work from Jason, the C player, to Daniel, yep. the A player, uh, to his plate is not a reward that Daniel should no. be getting. And when no. when you're a, a an experienced, great member of the team that's able to kill it on the workload you have, and the reward for that is, well, then you should be doing more. That's not a good business to no. stay in. That's, that's, you, you're not measuring success based on how, how much that person can achieve. You're supposed to be measuring success based on key performance metrics. Or even a, a, another situation, like, oh, you have two workers, right? They both have an hour to do something, right? One person, it takes them an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. Other person only takes 20 minutes. And then, oh, you only took your 20 minutes here's what more shit you do, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. what? Like, yeah, that's, that's, it's not fair to the, to the talented employer, uh, a talented employee, and, and they're not going to stay. They're not respected. It's, it's not fair. And so I, I, we talk a lot about case managers in, in my firm and with other personal injury firms when we interview. So a case manager is someone who's sort of like the first point of contact after we've signed up a personal injury case this case manager's job is to stay involved with your treatment and your treatment providers during the treatment phase of your case. Because my job as the attorney, I, I'm not negotiating while you're still in treatment because you're still in treatment. You haven't completed. They don't have all the facts. Yet. Yeah, I don't know how much your medical bills are. I, I can't tell you what your case value is because your medical doctors haven't said, this is how injured you. So get through the treatment, then we start the, the legal part of the process. But we still guide people through answers to their questions, all, all that stuff. So the case manager is that point of contact. And that case manager in different firms can have a different number of cases. Sometimes it's 30. Sometimes it's 60. Sometimes it's 200. Now, what kind of service is a case manager able to give if they're managing 200 cases? That's a lot. It's too many. That's a lot. It's too many. And, and a good case manager will stand up for themselves and say, this is too many. There's no way I can do a good job here. And a, a good case manager shouldn't be doing 100 cases because that there's no way you can do a good job if you're managing 100 cases. There's no way you're giving client-focused service, which is a, a requirement at Brumley Law Firm. Client-focused service doesn't happen if you have 100 cases. Yeah. And this is something that's a lot of people in general mess up on, right? So let's suppose um, I'm working for you, right? I'm, are you, getting, you pay me by the hour. I say, hey, Joshua, like, in order to do what I need to do this week, the task you gave me, I got to work overtime. Like, I'm not paying you overtime, no. But I work overtime anyway. Mm. You have to have to pay me, right? Absolutely. Every, every court case in the history of the United States, 
even if the employer said no, had the writing, do not work overtime. Yeah. They were overtime. The basic rule, pay for all, all hours work and time and a half, anything over 40 hours. Yeah. It has so nothing to do with they, with they had permission yeah, or no they permission. didn't. They work. If they work, they can prove they can work. You got to pay them the money. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm, it, maybe it's my punk background and my, my liberal background of living in uh, Tacoma and Seattle my whole life. But I've never been the employer that says, I'm not going to pay you for that. I'm the employer that says, talk but, to but, me about why you need that. Yeah, and let's have a conversation. You, and even if I tell you don't do it, if you did it, I'm going to be pissed at you, but I'm not going to not pay you. Yeah, or that's CCP that's people don't do that. obviously litigation. Yeah. And in Washington, if you, um, I've, I've had people who tried to hire me for issues like this, and I walked right away from those conversations. But um, if you do not pay one penny of someone's wage, they can hire an employment attorney and all of that of employment attorney's attorney's fees are owed by the employer to recover that one penny. Yeah. So just pay your employees what yeah. they worked, man. It's so silly. <laughs> if you have an employee who's abusing you, let them go. Don't create litigation for yeah. yourself as an employer by not paying them what they're entitled to. But again, people don't understand their rights. If you don't know I'm entitled to this money, and my employer is a piece of shit and not paying it. How are you going to know? You know, that's just the idea of making sure that people understand what their legal rights are yes. is a huge part of being in these liberal communities. Another thing too, like I'll tell people, like you know, the federal government or state government does not done, and I have any resources to go to every business every day and look what you're doing right. Right. Then you make an audio once in a while. What usually happens? An employee is going to bust drop a dime on you, right? Right. For example, suppose you have a an admin person, right, work for your company, right? Mm -hmm. And they get 30 minutes for lunch every day. And like, they like, I'll do that for you on lunch. I'll make a call for lunch. And then, you know, they work for lunch, you're thinking nothing about it. And a year later, they don't get promoted, don't get a raise. Now they're, they're pissed. Now they're pissed. Yep. Now they go to the Department of Labor. And usually, if an employee says something, they trust the employee, right, versus the employer, right? So now right. you got to pay all this back pay, all this other stuff, you know? Yeah. Another good, good example, like, you know, a lot of companies do, those contracts employees, right? So a lot of companies like, you know, like for example, I have like, there's a business that hired a social media contractor, right? Mm -hmm. on, on contract, right? Mm -hmm. And then something happened, the social media person got pissed off, quit and deleted all the social media accounts, right? And the social media person were like, I need my last paycheck. The company was like, oh no, like I'm not paying you. You fucked us, yeah. yeah. Well, the person, well, I'm gonna go to the city of Seattle and say I'm an employee. Well, you know, you're a contractor, right? So I looked at the stuff, the statement of work. I'm like, man, I want to, you don't want to hear this, but like this reads like you make a man, this, this person every single day. These reads are employee. So if I was you, I pay this little bit of money because not only is the city of going to say, hey, this person contract is an employee, but these other 30 so-called contractors. Yeah, yeah. They're going to presume they're all employees oh, too. And that they factor fought. test of yeah. whether a person is an employee or a contractor is a really basic test that anyone could look up. Yeah. And if, if your social media manager that you say is a contractor to try to get around paying their employment taxes, it, it, it looks up those factors and says, no, they required me to be to, at work every day from to, nine to five. Yeah, they, they, I didn't use my own laptop. They provided yeah. me with a laptop. Whatever these things are, like these are, these are really simple factors to go through and it's yes or no. Yeah. And if you're, if you're going to be, that's, that's another thing it, that, if you go back to that employee uh, who who was disgruntled and and then can go recover that money for that overtime, you think that an employment attorney who smells blood in the water for their attorney's fees, even if it's for one penny, isn't going to go depose the business and figure out every other employee that doesn't work there anymore yeah. and say, oh, you were you were making that receptionist work over their lunch break. How many receptionists have you had since you've been open? And not only, I want to talk to every one of them. And not only that, suppose the employee went to complain about, you know, how to work for lunch. They're going to presume if you're doing that one thing wrong, you're doing everything wrong. Yeah. And they're going to do deep dive. They're going to go to your, your onboarding, your I-9, your hiring practices. They're going to like, you, you, yeah. you know. What about sexual harassment policies? I, I've been um, a part of conversations at other people's law firms that make me cringe and shudder with my business experience and acumen and and what do you give as guidance for employers to make sure that they're not commenting on like another employee's appearance or or things that like 
I see as like, when, when people say, doesn't that haircut look nice on Dylan? I say, I'm an employer and I don't notice people's personal yeah. appearance. I That's mean, the, it's I a mean, joke that I make yeah. all the time. That's a tough one, right? I mean, sexual harassment is an odd beholder, right? Like you might tell someone, hey, hey, Becky, or that, that's a nice t-shirt or whatever, you know. Yeah. Some else might hurt right here, like, oh, that's sexual harassment, right? Right. You know, it's yeah, it's like I think one thing we need to do better, like, you know, like pose, like I tell Becky, you, you, you know, dress looks right. Hopefully she would say, Jason, I don't appreciate that. Don't say it again. I don't say it again. Right. But nowadays, most people when, go. When Becky draws that line in the sand, yeah. you understand it's a line yeah. not to cross. Yeah. But if someone's but, not drawing that line yeah. in the sand, how do you know? Yeah, you don't, unfortunately. I don't think so. I mean, it's like community standards, you know. And then, but most time, Becky would go to the boss and go to HR, file a complaint. I'm like, I was doing a compliment, right? Yeah, but those are big businesses. What about in these small businesses where there's not an HR person or where your employer, the, the only attorney in the firm, is the one making the comment? Yeah. You know, you don't do anything until you don't get that promotion. Yeah. And then I mean, they leave and then they say, well, let me drop a dime on everything that was going yeah. on there. I mean, of course, you can go to the city of Seattle, different places you can go, go to, you know, but it's stuff like if you have, you need a job, right? You know? Yeah. And then like, but if you're going to quit anyways, that's when shit pops off. Yeah. yeah. And, and so these employers who have They're made harassment, these harassment, comments, you know, or something, you know, like, you know, like I make this up, like, you know, like, Pose you give everyone off of, off of Christmas, but you have a, 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 a someone who follows Islam. Mm -hmm. You can't take off for this Islam holiday, right? Mm. You know stuff like that. You know a reasonable accommodations. You know or like, suppose someone's like has a handicap, but suppose someone you know had an accident, and they can't stand for more than an hour a day. And you don't have an up down desk yeah. for them. That's that's not reasonable accommodations. Yep. It, it's a lot of stuff, right? Um, I think a lot. I think a lot of companies get away with it because you know the boss is personable. Or people like them, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's so much stuff out there, right? It is, it, I mean, it's hard to be a small business owner, right? You have to know all this stuff, right? Yeah, but it's, it's sad because people just think it's so fun to be a small business owner and they don't sucks. know. Yeah, they don't know all of the work that's associated with it. They just want to put on a tie and like be the, the guy on a billboard. That's so stupid to me. You yeah. have to know this stuff. You have to understand what you cannot say to an employee. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if they're, a man or a woman or what race they are or or what gender they they um any of that any of that stuff does not matter and and when you hire people you're in a position where there's a a, a business relationship created that is like a legally observable yeah. relationship that a, an employment I mean attorney can come in and beat your ass with your own words. And it's so easy. You just have to be like incredibly aware of how what you say could be used I mean, against you, what you text, what you email, yeah. all that shit. Times are different. You know, way back in the day, you know, it was common, you know, you were a male boss, you probably dated your female coworker mm. or your female subordinate and they got married, you know, a couple years down the road. Yeah. Yeah. That shouldn't happen now, right? No, 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 no. That's, like, that's so probably why so many people are single now, right? Yeah. <laughs> I hope not. I mean, you just you need to meet people in your industry that don't work for you. Yeah, you I mean, can, it's not hard. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you only attracted the one person that works for you. You're not attracted to anyone else. Yeah. Well, fire the person and then date them. Exactly. That's <laughs> awesome, right. Yeah, and and plus, if you're a small business owner, like no, I, I have a saying. It's like kind of non HR, but like you need great people in your company. But how become a lot of company, you know, kind of suck, right? Yeah. Like I have a theory. I can't prove this, but like. During my time in the army, post army jobs, and now like I have a theory like every organization is twenty percent of the people there who are like like they're like that's great, right? I like, suppose twenty percent of them pay suppose they get paid a hundred thousand a year. They're like, man, I get paid a hundred thousand dollars to do this. I need to prove that I'm worth this. I need to add two hundred thousand dollars of value. I need to do this. And this the A players, yeah. The other eighty percent like I only get paid a hundred thousand. <laughs> I'm only gonna do this. I'm only gonna do this. And then you know, the Those... A players keep on going like this. The other players keep on going like this, and the other players like, man, what's going on here, right? Yeah, yeah. So, how do you how do you find a players? How do you attract talent? Well, uh, let me let me just say how we do it, and you tell me okay. what I could be doing better because I think this is something that we do a, a good job at, and and it's research that I'm constantly trying to understand what attracts the Before a you say, Let me say this: like one thing a pet peeve of mine when people say I'm a hiring expert. No, you're not. Yeah. Are you telling me everyone you hired is a home run employee for your company? I highly doubt that. Well, 
that's the that's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. You always want that. Yeah. You want the best person for the best uh, position. But I think when you're when you're searching for A players, when you're searching for people who are going to exceed expectations, you have to understand what that person wants in a in a in a business that they put their name and their uh, experience behind. What that person brings to the table and if you were that person, would you want to work for you as a boss? When when they see how you are as an employer or how you are as an employee at your job, you know, what does that look like to that A player? I try really hard to exhibit that. I guess I don't try because it's just who I am. It's it's in, inherent in being the business owner. I'm so excited about doing what I do that I don't really have to try. But if I if I had made that dress code that my other employee had had mentioned to me and said everyone has to wear a three piece suit every day and I'm going to wear my t-shirt. What is that going to do to the morale of the A player? They're going to start looking for other jobs. Yeah. And so you have to understand how these things are perceived from someone who's going to be like a rider for your firm, a ride or die person for your firm. Those are the people you need. And if that means I need to let them work from home one day a week so that they can be around their family, so be it. If that's what it takes for that person to, to commit to my business, to commit to being a Brumley law firm die hard person, that is an easy win for yeah. me. You know, if, if there are things beyond salary that I can accommodate for the right people, absolutely, I'm going to do it. But then it goes to like, okay, if I'm accommodating this for one person, do I have to do it for all? And if I have to do it for all, do I have room for C people who are going to abuse that? Yeah. The C, the C players who are going to say, I'm working from home today, and then they go back to bed. That's just yeah. not the type of people that you want working for your business. And if there's someone, as you're listening to this, who comes to mind as I'm talking about this, let that person go. Yeah. Rip the Band-Aid off. Sit them down on Monday morning and say, hey, I really appreciate all the time you've put into this business, but it's time for our professional careers to end. And I definitely think as a leader, you got to realize that people are motivated by different things. Right. Like, suppose you, suppose you have you have a person who works for you. They're married, and their eight-year-old kid is, plays baseball, and the baseball games are at 3 p.m. on Wednesdays, right? Yeah. Maybe you want to let them go, right? And, you know... But then let them go early, though. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not but, let them go. Yeah, let but... them go <laughs> and of course, they have to understand you leave them at 2 p.m. this day that our work you miss from 2 to 5, I expect you make it up like on your own time, something like that, right? Mm. Or maybe someone's single and they're really big into fucking running marathons. Right. And there's a marathon they want to run that's like Saturday morning in, I don't know, some 18 hour flight somewhere crazy, right? And they need to leave. Boston. Yeah. They got to go to Boston yeah, Marathon. You know, maybe you let them do it, right? But the yeah. thing is, like, how do you. But then you have to have a culture where like people aren't jealous, right? Think right. about jealousy. Why you let Jason go run a marathon? Why right. you why you let Tom go to a baseball game? I'm gonna do this. But that's that mentality that you were just talking about, where there's the employees who say, I make a hundred thousand dollars a year. I need to bring more than double of yeah. that to the business, not the employees who say, exactly. I only make a hundred thousand dollars a year. Because you're never gonna change that person's no. mind. That's who that person is and that's who they will always be and when people tell you who they are Believe listen Cause, listen because odds are the person who went to see the baseball game at 2 p.m has already done everything they needed to do they knew that they needed that time off and they exceeded expectations so that when they came to you and said hey i need this time off everything is perfect Sorry. with a bow bam, bam 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 you won't need me yep. you won't need me to be here for that time that i'm gone because i took care of business or even they didn't take care of hey i can't i can't do this but I, I, I train, Sunday, I'm going to yeah, come back here. I, oh, yeah. I, I train, you know, Mary Beth, exactly what you do, and she's good to go, so you're going to cover for me, right? Yeah, yeah. And and that's uh, uh, building the right team is not something that happens in the, overnight. Yeah. It's something that takes a lot of time and a lot of trial and error. And when you're a business owner and you're listening to these statements, like, understand it's not going to be perfect overnight, but someone who's been with you for five years who's just a staple of the business, but you know, as you listen to this, they are not dedicated to the bottom line. They're not the person that answers the phone over the weekend. They're not the person who's going to come in on their nights because some emergency happened. Is that the person you want to go to trial with? 
and here's another one too. This happens a lot too, right? So let's suppose you will say um, Mary filed a complaint against like Bob, right? Most companies like, man, Mary's been here for two months. Bob's been here for five years. Like, there's a way we believe Mary. Well, odds are Bob's a piece of shit. Yeah. And no one said anything about him, right? Right. If you do research, or maybe you did exit, maybe you did exit interviews, you would see all mm-hmm. of Bob's favorite employees who left would say Bob's a fucking fucking pervert, right? Yeah. I yeah. think too many companies are like, oh, Jason's been here six years. Yeah. We know him, right? Do you really? Yeah, no, you, you don't. Know. You know what he tells you yeah. about himself. And so it, exit interviews, another huge tool that I think don't do that. It's so sad. Or they'll be like, they make it like seem forced, you know, or like mm-hmm. like a lot of people like say, I'll do exit interviews in person. That's no. I think it should be online, right? Because like, oh, that's a that's a good example. Tell. You you like, I, I quit. I get fired or whatever. You would do exit interview me. In my mind, I'm thinking, man, he's gonna try to, you know, got I got I got me bored. Do something. Right. I'm not gonna tell you the truth in person, right? Mm. But I think if you do it online, and plus you I get a I, lot more truthful feedback yeah. when you're not under the pressure of in yeah. person. And plus, I think you gotta. I don't think, I think you should wait at least a couple of weeks too, right? I don't think you should like do it the day after, right? Because mm. most of us are hot, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think you know just. Yeah, this fucking fall off. <laughs> there we go. I got it. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, no, it's that. Yeah. I, I think I've been incredibly successful with exit interviews. That's such a valuable resource. Um, and and I think it, it comes down to like, I'm not the boss who's gonna throw a tantrum if someone's quitting. I'm gonna say, hey, it's it's okay with me. So many people, you just lowered me. Yeah, okay. yeah. You're disloyal. Are you, are you Who cares? Me? Who cares? If this the nineteen eighties over. Yeah, yeah. This person is not dedicated to your business the way that you're dedicated to your business, and that's okay. So many people get that wrong too. Yeah, yeah, and that's okay. But if they're telling you I don't want to work here, that's not a personal like slight. That's about the business and about what they see as their future. So that's okay. But ask them, what about this job could I be doing better? Yeah. And ask them, what about this job was tough for you when you started? And I got so much feedback when I started doing those exit interviews about the training process that it made me change immediately when I got that feedback from three people in a row that I sat down and said, tell me what I could be doing better as a boss. But I had that rapport because that's the type of employer I am, the type of boss I am. I said, I need to know how I can do better for the next person who sits in that chair. And that's important to me. And if that's not important to you as an employer, reevaluate being an employer yeah. because you're not helping people. You're hurting people. You're yeah. taking from people. That's a good point. And so I, I, I understood that I was, I was letting people down with the training that I was doing. And I wasn't doing a good job taking entry-level people off the street who had that great work ethic and that great cultural fit and putting them in a position to be successful for the job I was putting them in because they didn't have the experience. But there's so few people who have experience in this industry that the attorneys all fight over. And I didn't want to do that. You know, I didn't want to try to steal someone from a, another plaintiff's personal injury firm. I wanted to create more people in this pool. That's how we fix this solution. It's, I don't need to steal Mary from my buddy Cole's law firm. I need to create a Mary. Yeah. How do I create a Mary? That's training. Yep. And I was not doing a good job training these people. Yeah. So we created this really robust training program on Trainual, which really just changed everything for us. And now every employee, no matter if they have experience or not, has to go through that training. So no one can say, I never got training. Well, how about this? That happens all the time too. Like some will say, you know, Jason's like, Jason's fucking up. He's not doing right. He kept on messing up. Well, have you told Jason messed up? Jason knows he's messing up. Are you sure? Yeah. How long has Jason been messing up? Like three months? So you're telling me Jason has messed up on purpose three months and you never told him anything. Brutal honesty is an important component of effective management. And so you, you let Jason mess up for three months. They said nothing. And so how's that affecting your business, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's a level of honesty that people really appreciate and you don't have to be an asshole oh, no. to That's give to constructive criticism. You don't have to be an asshole. I want to know if I'm messing something up. And maybe I have thicker skin than most people, but I also think that when I'm giving that constructive criticism, it's never going to be, hey, you're a fuck up. Yeah. It's, hey, man, 
you and I both want to do the best possible job for this client. Here's how I would have done yeah, that. Yeah. And maybe you'll be more successful the yeah. next time you do it if you do it this yeah, way. Yeah, you definitely want to say, dude, you, you're, you're the worst fucking poor in the history. Yeah, yeah fucking, that's, not, say, that's not going to help so, people. Yeah, like, uh, show, me how you, show me how you're doing this. Yeah. Okay, have you thought about doing this way? Yeah, there's, there's really easy ways to adjust an employee's um, successful completion of a task if they're not being successful. You just have to understand that not everyone's going to be uh, receptive to direct feedback. Yeah, delivery is important. Yeah, delivery is incredibly important. And and you don't want to make it personal. And when, when in my experience, a lot more employees um, are sensitive to that, where they're like, when they know they messed something up, they come to me and they're kicking themselves harder than I would even give that yeah. feedback. And I say, this is not... The level that you're taking this error is not beneficial to our client. Yeah. Your response right now is the only thing that you can control. And let's get back on the horse and keep riding because we have a job to do. Yeah. And you, you know, just sitting in this uh, bad feeling about how you mess something up isn't going to be beneficial yeah. to, to the future of this case. You have to fix this problem. How are we going to fix it? Come to me. Let's talk about a solution and let's just keep going. People yeah. make mistakes. That's inevitable. They do. They That's also, inevitable. also tell people to like, is way to be a good boss, good leader, good whatever? Be that to your people that you want somebody to be to you, right? Yeah. But unfortunately, some people don't do that, right? It's really sad, man. And and that was something that I think made me a really bad employee when I was working for other people is I didn't respect my bosses. And if there was a boss that came to me and leveled with me, and I, I, liked the work that I was doing, it would be a whole different version of me, yeah. you know? But so many of these bosses just didn't respect me. Why would I respect them? Yeah, when I was Army one time, one of the boss, he told us, like, like, and across the Army, you know, you're not supposed to complain about your boss to people below you, right? It's like, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So he was doing that. He's like, man, my boss is, like, micromanaging me, this, this, and this. I can't stand it. Guess we did the next very fucking next second. Micromanage the fuck out of us. Yeah. We're looking like, is he not seeing this? Like yeah, yeah. It's it's. So let's talk about that concept. Like, why do you think the army? Why do you think uh, successful organizations prov or or encourage uh, employers or managers or bosses or uh, senior officials to not shit talk the people above them to the people under them? Why do you think that concept exists? I mean, I think part of it is like loyalty, you know, like you trust the people above, you know, it's, it's bad. Name. But then again, it's like, it's bad manners. And again, it's like, if my boss is a horrible boss, he's treating me badly. I can't tell people about it, right? I just got to fucking suck it up and suffer, you know? Yeah. The army's bad about that, right? Well, I think the solution is you got to talk to that person. And the army is not a great place yeah, to get that's that, not, that, that, that. That does that, not happen. But, but in an organization, like my law firm. I really want to encourage people who are working for me to have that open level of communication with me. I don't want a manager in my firm to go behind my back yeah. to the other managers in my firm and say, I really wish Josh wouldn't do this. Yeah, I want them to come to me and say, Josh, I wish you wouldn't do this. Yeah, in the army, you gotta, you gotta like trust in the system that if your boss is horrible, that their boss is it, right? Like one time I had a horrible boss and one time, so in the army, your boss is probably your raider, and then the, the senior raider is like their boss, right? Senior raider came to me and said, "Well, Jason, I just want you to know, like, I really appreciate how you're managing, you know, so and so, right?" Mm. So me, that's key. Was like, I know this guy fucking sucks, but he's doing a great job, and I recognize it, right? Oh, that's yeah. good. That's yeah. good. So that visibility of your your grand boss yeah. coming down to you and yeah. saying, "Like, I see this, right?" Yeah. You know, okay. I, I can't that's do this right good. now, but come time for your evaluation and stuff, you will take care of you, right? Okay, good. So in in an organization like that's not a military organization, just a business. How do you prevent or encourage management from not fucking up morale by talking, talking shit? Like how do you, how do, when, when I have to give bad news to a manager and I say, you're not meeting X, Y, or Z, I need you to perform to this level and you're falling short. I want to give that feedback directly to them. I don't do it in a public way. Yeah. I give it privately so that they can give that private feedback to me if they think I'm being um, 
too aggressive with my approaches or, or these, these KPIs or, or um, metrics that I'm insisting that they meet are just not meetable, they're not achievable metrics. I want that open feedback from them. But when we leave that room, I want to be a united front. And I, publicly, I don't ever want to see any division between two leaders in the same yeah. organization. That's, that's not going to bode well for no. the future of that organization. No. So publicly, like on the internet or, or social media, for example, if a manager is complaining about their employer, that's a huge red flag. But also inside the business, if you're complaining about coworkers or you're complaining about a manager or you're complaining about uh, the person under you, that, that affects morale in, a, in an unfixable way. How do you prevent that from happening? I think it's tough, you know. I don't want to say you can't prevent it, but you can, but it's, it's tough, right? It's like, and plus, you know, I think egos get involved, you know. Egos, yeah. You know, he, he said this, you know, or mm -hmm. even though it's like a private conversation, even the private conversation, they're going to tell someone, right? Yeah. Man, Joshua just blew my ass, you know. I don't deserve this, right? I'm the best employee, whatever, yeah. you know, like blah, blah, blah. I do this for the He's company, setting you know? unrealistic expectations yeah. of what I'm supposed to be doing and how am I supposed to clone myself or like, and this and that. How you talking to me? He let, you know, Jason go to a baseball game at 2 p.m. What type of shit is this, right? Yeah, yeah. They start all, comparing themselves to those these, C players when they know they're the A players instead of saying, all these this is the feedback. Politics and, like, stuff comes to play, right? Office and old. I have to say, like, no matter how old you get, where your level is, it all goes back to fucking high school. Yeah. All goes back to fucking clicks, right? Everyone, oh, this and this, right? Hmm. It's, yeah, it's not easy, right? It's tough. So I guess the only way to, to manage those kinds of things to prevent them from happening is to just I think have the conversations yeah, that, before yeah, they happen. I think you have to be upfront, you know, like. This is not appropriate yeah. for anyone to be having these kinds of conversations, especially management having these conversations with. Yeah. Uh, other management, you need to come to me if you're yeah. saying something's unfair or a metric is is yeah. not reasonable. And I think with managers too, like so many managers get promoted with no training, right? Yeah. Another thing too, like in most companies, like suppose, like I'll make this up. Suppose you're working at a, a, a construction company, right? Mm -hmm. You're all part of the team, right? There's 10 people you like, your job is like build whatever, right? And then you get promoted. Now you're the boss of the nine people you just have beers for the last week, right? Yeah. And so many people can't do that, right? They're like right. they don't know how to separate. Oh, I'm the boss now. There's still the, you know, the old boy Vitelli, right? Yeah. And then, and it's usually not the the guy who got promoted. It's like the guys below them, right? They don't respect. Yeah. Them. Hey, Jason, what the fuck are you do? You mean I got to do this? You're, yeah. you're fucking drinking beers other night in my house, right? Type of shit is right. Yeah. And course, I invited you to my wedding. Yeah. What exactly. the hell? <laughs> exactly right. Now you're gonna try to be my boss. Yeah. No, that's an incredibly difficult part of promoting from within, but also like it's so much better to promote from within than to take a risk on someone that you yeah, don't know. You know that person, yeah. Yeah, so I, I try really hard to always promote from within, but our management team is, is pretty solid, and when we're promoting from within, it's usually like our reception person, our, our entry-level position yeah. is someone who we see their work ethic, and yeah. we start putting them through that yeah. case manager training process move them into a role where they're going to be doing more yeah professional development is so important so many people don't do that so many so many people don't yeah i i actually am a, a professor at highline community college in their paralegal program mm -hmm. and uh the the professor who's my boss he's he's like don't you think it's so great that you have this pipeline of people who you get to see as a student and then hire from and i say yeah it's it's wonderful he said don't you think other employers would benefit from taking the people who are in their firm that they know their work ethic and putting them into our programs so that they can have the legal experience? That's a good point. And he's like, just go out, be a, be a voice in the community that says, if you have someone who's good and you want to see them move up, invest in their professional development, invest in their education, give them resources that they wouldn't have if not for you. And you know that they're dedicated. You know that they're going to stick around. But if you want someone to go get a bachelor's degree in business so that they can be your operations manager or whatever, go invest. Give them the tools. And if they tell you, this is not something that I want to do, then listen to what they have to say. Don't force people to, to be proactive. Give them tools and see what they do. So how do you deal with this, right? Like, suppose you have someone who works for you, right? In your mind, like, man, this person has all the players in the world. I can see this person like being an A-plus player, doing great things, but 
they just perform at sea level, right? They don't mm -hmm. see this. They don't see the greatness themselves. You see it. They don't see it. Like, how do you do? Like, you, I don't say like give up on them, right? But do you like how much time do you spend like trying to motivate them? Like, hey, hey, Jace, like man, like you'd be doing so much better for yourself. Yeah. You're adding so yeah. much stuff, right? How do you do that? I think that's that's a current struggle. Um, you have to understand what motivates that person specifically, and it's not always money. And you know, money has been historically my greatest motivator in jobs. I, I said, well, if I'm making $20 an hour at this job and this other job's going to hire me for 25, why would I stay here? I had no loyalty to Fred Meyer or whatever, you know, like I don't care. Um, but I think when you're a small business owner, loyalty comes into play and the relationships you have with your employees absolutely comes into play when it's not a big corporation. And, um, and money is potentially a motivator for, for people, but if they're not performing and you see that value, throwing money at them is not going to fix that problem. Yeah. So what is? And it's really a case-by-case -case situation where you have to understand what does motivate this person. Why aren't they performing? And the only way that you get to understanding that as a, as a supervisor is understanding that person individually, taking the time to get to know that person on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And if you're managing staff in a group setting or in passing, you're not managing your staff. You have to have a relationship with that person individually. That's what keeps key people involved in where they're at and what gives them the buy-in. They have to understand what motivates you and what excites you. And, and if you don't know what your people are doing in their free time that makes them happy, that, that that's why they go to work every day, to go do that thing that they wanna do outside of work, then that's just a big question mark yeah. for you. You're not going to be an effective leader in those situations. Yeah. So understand your staff, understand what they like to do, understand who they are when they're not at work and, and be that open with them. Show them that side of you in a one-on-one -on -one way, not in a group setting, not in passing. Get to know your people. Yeah. Really too, like a lot, a lot of people mess up too. Like they have a small business and like 20, they have like, I don't, I don't, I, I don't want to do like the 20 white guy thing, so I'll change it up. Like they have like 20 Hispanic females, right? Uh, you know, and then you have 20 Hispanic females. It's going to be hard to hire someone not like that, right? Or, or people like, like I I'm trying to hire something else, right? But they still go to the same place over and over again, right? Mm, mm. I've never had that issue. I think that my firm has constantly uh, been diverse since the first day that we started. And... Um, I'm very proud of that, but it hasn't been something that I've really had to seek well, out. But so that just happened organically for you, right? Yeah, yeah. It was. I it think was, that's how it's supposed to be. Uh, it's like, it's something that I've always had an eye on because as a white man in the law world, I didn't want to only hire other white men. I didn't want to only hire other white men, but I've been so impressed with the candidates that I've had from just every level you know, receptionists, legal assistants, case managers, paralegals, and attorneys. The, the people I've worked with have been from he, just tons of different diverse backgrounds. Yeah. And um, and I don't know if that's because of, of the roles that I've created and the boss that I am and the, the community involvement that I have in, in these organizations that help me to find staff and the students that I get to see as a professor. Um, so the Highline College is a pretty diverse college too. Absolutely, right? yeah. And Kent is a very diverse community. So it's not like Seattle or, or yeah. Tacoma that's more metropolitan and, and has you know a lot more people but a lot more white people. Yeah. Kent is a very international town. Yeah. And that's where our, our focus is, is. Our main base is, is in the city of Kent. So maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. Yeah. After I, 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 one extreme, I think too many, too many people like this hired like all those same race. And other people, they try too hard to be diverse, right? Mm. Like, I'm only gonna hire. So my thing is like, I think I hire the best person, right? But have a comment, the best person can be in many different demographics, right? Yeah, yeah. In many demographics. I think it, understanding your hiring process is really important. And if you're finding people the exact same way, and then wondering why they're the, the exact same types of people, yeah. then and also make it easy to apply for a job too, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I've I've hired some of my best people from Craigslist. Mm -hmm. Truly, you know what I I like. I found about Craigslist hiring maybe when I got the army back in 2015. To this day, I like still boggle my mind. Like, 
when I think of Craigslist, I think like scammy shit, you know. Yeah, yeah, but like, I've you know, hired some like, of my like best people. The illegal on stuff, you know. Yeah, like, you know, like, but everyone I talk to, like, man, I get my best over Craigslist. I mean, I've had I've had bad people from Craigslist too. Don't get me wrong, but that's just people, you it know. It blows my mind that Craigslist is like like top in, in hiring place, right? I think when you're an employer and you have a job, that's something of value, and to get the right people applying for that mm -hmm. job, you have to have visibility as it, many places as possible. Yeah. Everywhere. And if Craigslist is what people know, go to Craigslist. That's one thing that kills me. Like you have a, a small business, right? And they have like opening for, let's say a market person. No one will apply for a market person. Where, where you apply, where, where's the job at? It's on my website. Is it anywhere else? Yeah. No. If they really want the job, they'll come find it. Dude, you're fucking stupid as fuck. Yeah, no, that's crazy. If you post a job on your website and it's not cross posted on a, on a platform that yeah. people have visibility. I mean, even Amazon cross posts shit every yeah, day. You know? Yeah, man. Like, that's, that's another great point. You know, when you're a small business owner, understand what other people are doing that are bigger than you and emulate them. Yep. You know, find out where Amazon is finding people, where Starbucks is finding people, where. It, People say, oh, it's so hard to find good talent. I don't believe that. I don't either. I don't, I don't think that good talent is you can't stopped find, existing is, is it, because of COVID. Is you can't find good talent or you're fucking, or you make it too hard if people apply or people. Or you're a bad media, boss a bad or a, boss, yeah. a, a bad business to work for. You find shit people that are the only ones that, that want to work at your business because you're a shit business, man. Like stop being a shit business. Another thing too, like suppose someone says they have a business, they say, man, in order for somebody to work here, I got to pay 9% of the labor market, right? My competition only has to pay 50%. That might be an indicator you have to pay them some money because that's someone who fucking sucks to work at your company. Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you're not offering all the same advantages that the industry is offering. So understanding, again, what, what are your, uh, I don't want to say competitors because I don't see any of these other plaintiffs, personal injury attorneys as competitors. These are people that are fighting the good fight the same way I am against the insurance companies, the insurance companies, my enemy, not the other plaintiffs attorneys. But if there's something that these other plaintiffs attorneys are offering that I'm not offering that I could be, I need to. That's, yeah. that's how I'm able to keep that market saturated with good people. Thank you too. Like, you know, pose your, like, we'll say, give you a benefit. You're, you're, good, you're a good boss. Like in 2021, doesn't mean you're a good boss now, right? Things change. Times change. Yeah. Generations change, you know, what one generation wants, someone else wants, you know, like this has worked for you today doesn't mean it can work tomorrow, right? It's very true. Very true. I, I've run this business almost 10 years now, and um, I've learned a lot over that 10 years about what it means to be a good boss, what it means to uh, be a good uh, manager of people, and, and that every person has different needs. Yeah. Understanding those needs is the, the key, man. That it, if you don't understand your people, how can you run a business? Sometimes you just have to be a good human too, right? Yeah. Like if someone comes to you and says, hey, you know, my, you know, grandmother died, you know. And and I suppose like suppose you had a, a policy that says, you know, I give you five days off but only for your mother, father, whatever. Someone says, you know, my grandfather died. Are you gonna say, I don't give a fuck? Yeah. The policy says this, right? That's that's outrageous that any or, employer. But the things I hear from these previous uh, law firms that my staff have worked for, it is like nightmarish. Yeah. Things that I would never in my life dream of saying to another human being, let alone someone who is dedicating their time to my business yeah. for an hourly wage. Yeah. But it is overwhelming what we hear from other lawyers in the world. It's across the uh, whole Society, it's just right? business. It's just or, terrible or, or business. Like people, people. say, um, you can't time funeral you know, for people to die. Uh, friends, right? Like, I, I don't think I ever work for anyone again. But I have like five friends. They died, dude. Either you let me go, I'm fucking quitting. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, this is an over end. I, I know. No, I I can't imagine having different requirements for someone who's dealing with a loss based on what your relationship was. Were they blood? Yeah. What, did, did, were you raised by your grandparents or were you raised by your parents and your grandparent died? Well, grandparents die. I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. You know? Like what? So you spent two, no. you spent one, one week a month with them? Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. Good. You yeah. Are close. Your friends, how close of a friend? Did you go to high school with them or did you drop off after high school with them? Did you them? donate like, a kidney to them? Yeah. Like, yeah. You know? Like that's a slippery slope. If someone is telling you they need time off, you need to understand is this someone who's going to abuse time off 
or is this someone who's going to be dedicated to the business and give them what they need? Now, and course. if there's someone that's going to abuse time off, you know that before they re just let them go. Yeah. Stop playing games yeah. with them now, and putting yourself in a position that's going to lead to a lawsuit later because you said the wrong shit. Now, if I walk for you and I say, hey, my granddaddy died, you're like, I mean, is, is this your 10th granddaddy that died? Yeah, yeah. You that, know, that's something different. Yeah, that's a whole different thing. But that's the person who's abusing your system, and you just need to let that person go before before they get to the point of abusing you. Yeah. That's, that's not the common thing. Most of the time, the staff that I have aren't going to come to me with some hypothetical grandma because they wanted to take the week off for a, a camping trip. Yeah. They wanted the week off for the camping trip. They feel comfortable coming to me and saying, boss, I want the week off for a camping trip. Can you make that happen? And not saying you need to know every person, detail your people, but if you have some kind of relationship, you're going to know all this stuff, right? You're going to know, hey, I was raised my grandparents or my camp is big, you, you know, without being like too uh, private, getting into our private life too much, you know? You know, I... I people, like, what's the word called? They, um, they tell people a lot of stuff without you even asking them. Right. I think another thing that's really powerful at, at my business, and hopefully I'm not um, telling on myself with the staff that I have, but I'm very involved on social media. I'm, I'm Like I said, I'm constantly glued to my phone, always working. And if my staff is a social media person, I'm going to engage with them on social media. And I'm never going to do it without asking first. I'm going to have that conversation. Do you feel comfortable being you know, friendly with me on the internet? because I like to make posts and I yep. want to tag my staff in those yep. posts because that's visibility that my yep. business can benefit from. And if they say yes, then I'm going to engage with them on the internet. But if they're posting on a day that they take off sick, that they're out on some boat in the summer and they think I'm not going to see it, yeah. that's weird. Yep. You know, hopefully every employer has that ability to have that relationship with their staff. And it's not to spy on them, but it's to understand that like, these are people that are living their lives and learn what they like to do. Yeah. And if they're telling you, I like to camp every Memorial Day yeah. and I need that time off to drive to the campsite and pack up the campsite afterward. And so I'm not going to be here Tuesday either. Let them have the time. If they're not a good employee, don't keep them around. Yeah. That's what many people do, right? It's just, uh, they, they're scared of change, maybe. Yeah. They're scared of the work that it takes to hire another person. But that's pennies compared to what that person's costing you in uh, efficiency at the business, in the, the peace of mind that you have when a staff is just showing up to work yeah. without you being over their shoulder. Like, are you standing over everyone's desk every single day watching their screen for eight hours? Or are you trusting them to do their job? Yeah. If you're trusting them to do their job, are they, are they doing it? If they're not doing it, how do you know? If you don't have metrics in place to measure how the job is supposed to be done, they might not even know that there's a disconnect, that you're expecting more out of them than they're giving you. Your job as an employer is to give people that visibility in what does a good job look like? Yeah. How is it measured? Now go do it. And this is another reason, like I say, people don't fire fast. This is the reason you need to fire fast, right? Yeah. Like suppose it happens all the time. Like suppose, you know, Mary's working for you. Mary's not working out right. And you decide, you know what, Monday, I'm going to fire Mary. Friday, she tells you she's pregnant. Oh. You're, you're fucked. Yeah. Because yeah. e even if you fire for all the marriage, you know, your paperwork, things are a good job. Someone, Mary, Mary's mother, someone's going to go to social media somewhere and say, hey, they fired Mary because she's pregnant. Yep. Mary told them she's pregnant, she got fired the next day. Yep. That's why you got to. And then it, it can be a case with males too, you know, right? Yeah. You know, it could be like, you know, hey. I'm gonna fire Jason on Monday. I come to you, hey, I gotta have you no, know, I, I have cancer now, whatever, right? You know, in case you're right. You have yeah. to fire people. As, of course, you need to give them time to get trained up and learn whatever. But like, yeah, don't just fire them immediately if they if they have no tools to be successful. Six months have passed, and you know you've done everything you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or three years have passed, and they were a great employee, and then all of a sudden, shit changed. You know, I I work with an attorney who had an employee um, for a long time who was doing a great job. And then at one point, something changed for him. And it might've been personal. It might've been, he just saw that he was the only A player. I don't know what it was, but he saw a change in that person that eventually led to just over and over conversations that had to happen where the attorney was trying to coach him. 
and trying to help him get back to who he was, he just didn't care. Yeah. He didn't want to. And it, eventually, he just wasn't there anymore. He just stopped showing up. He didn't Something formally happened. quit. Something he didn't. Happened. He didn't have some blow up. He just wasn't there the next day. Something happened. Something yeah. personally or the yeah. Yeah, and it, it it was never clear to that attorney. Yeah. So let's talk about performance reviews real fast, right? Yeah. So like, I know a lot of people could do yearly performance reviews. Like, I believe you need to do some kind of performance metrics, but I don't believe annual reviews, right? Because like, my point of view, I could be wrong. Like, suppose I've worked for you, right? Me and like Mary, me and Bob worked for you, right? And you do review on December, right? So the whole year, I was a great worker, right? He was a piece of shit worker. November, something happens. I kind of slack off, right? He even picks up. Odds are you only remember what happened in November, December. Mm -hmm. You know? You and don't some, remember January through you know, everything else. So there's no documentation. No mm -hmm. one's doing anything. Most people only remember what's recent, right? Yeah, but those two employees remember how oh, the yeah. rest of the year was. And maybe because people have the idea that annual review means a raise, which doesn't necessarily. Which it should not. No, no. It should it not. Shouldn't. Thank you for doing your job yeah. for the year that you worked here. And if you exceeded expectations, maybe you're eligible for a raise. Yeah. But people come to me with their handout at their one year anniversary. And sometimes that's the last conversation we have with yeah. them. You know, that I'm sorry, this is not something that you exceeded expectations. You're not eligible for a yeah. raise or, or a promotion or something that you think you're entitled to. And this is where we and our, our professional paths together. Yeah. That's okay. What, what, what do you have you say on this, like, so people like gender pay, right? This is my take on gender pay, right? I think a lot is on the employer, right? Because, example, suppose, um, so several things. Suppose me and Mary, well, get, you hire me and Mary, right? Both of you are people, right? For six months, or even before that, you will say you both can pay us 70000 right? Odds are, that's so 95% of I, as a guy, going to come to you like, dude, I'm worth way more than this, right? Mm -hmm. And you will probably, you might say, you might say no. I'm just going to say yes. So instead of 70000 I say 75000 Mary, you're like, oh, thank you very much. Yeah. And then 75000 70000 years go on, get the same increase of pay, but keeps on going on. Right. And to make it worse, we're both for six months. I'm coming to you, hey, Josh, I'm going to work on time every day. I deserve a raise. Right. You might say, you might say no. Mary blows a fucking $25 million court case. Yeah. Like increase everything. And they tell that's for race. I'm just doing my job right. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. I I think uh just as a general idea, men oversell themselves in interviews and about their experience and uh about what they bring to the table to to the level that they're just shitty con artists. And women generally, not every woman, obviously, but they will undersell themselves. Yeah. And just take a first offer. And I tell every woman I know, like I kind of mentioned, like, I don't care how happy with the offer. I don't care if you want eighty thousand, eight hundred, twenty thousand dollars, ask for more. Like more vacation time and ask for something. And gosh, I, I hope my employees don't use this against me for the rest of my life. But if anyone's listening to this, by asking for something, that doesn't mean you're rejecting the offer and it's not disrespectful. If you tell me Hey, I just can't make eighty thousand work, Josh. Um, can can we do eighty five? If if that's really what you believe, I'll try to make eighty five work for the right person. If you're telling me, hey, eighty is good, but can we do eighty yeah. five? You know, I'm not going to hold that against you as your boss. If I can't get to eighty five, I'm going to tell you no. And if you say, okay, well then we'll just do eighty. Then that's well, maybe fine. someone says, you know, uh, you know, you give me like eighty thousand ten days vacation. Like, I really need 21 days. I'm willing to go down to $75,000 in 21 days. Yeah, yeah. Give me a counter that makes sense financially for me if there's some other level of flexibility that you're asking for. But I, again, that's just a generality. I'm so impressed with my industry having so many powerful women in it because, like, negotiation about bills and, and money is such a big part of what we do in this industry. And there are just a lot more women doing it. Um, but then w the the pressure is on when you're having that conversation with an employer who you respect, who's not adversarial, and you get put in what's considered an adversarial position with that person that you care about because you're like, hey, I love this job. I do this job well, but I don't want you to think that I'm ungrateful. Yeah. And for whatever reason, men have no problem being ungrateful. <laughs>
yeah. or being perceived as yeah. ungrateful. Yeah. Because I don't think it's ungrateful to yeah. ask for a, a raise yeah. if you believe you've exceeded but expectations. I, I think the mistake is a lot of employers, small business, big business, just because someone asks you a raise doesn't mean you have to give it to them, right? Right. I think so many people are like, I'm going to ask Josh for a raise. I don't deserve one, but he says, yes, I get a raise, right? Yeah. And so many people that give raises without doing the research. Okay, if I give Jason a raise of 5%, how does it affect the bottom line? How does it affect this? How does he know, like, all that kind of stuff, you know? I think uh, the feedback that I've gotten is don't give merit raises. Pay everyone the same pay for the same job and have the same metrics for everyone. And if people are, are exceeding those metrics, promote them. Yeah, I also think you know you should you should pay based on labor market, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and of course, here's a good and bad example. I had a friend one time, and she went on LinkedIn and she complained, like, I don't understand this, right? She was an HR person too. How is it that my friend, who is a guy, is making so much money for me in Seattle? I don't get it. We're both doing the same job. We're HR person. I like, I got online, dude. I mean, hey, like, you you are HR in small town, fuck Arkansas, yeah, or nonprofit. He is an HR business partner in Amazon in right. Seattle. It's different so worlds. Partners, like, how do you not understand this? Like, the labor market is different, right? Right, right. And so understanding that paying someone in Renton is probably going to be a higher pay than someone that's, you know, in Olympia. Yep. It's, it's just what is the market paying for those people? And if you're willing to pay someone to be remote, you might be able to get really beneficial staff mm -hmm who are remote in a different place yeah. because they can't commute to no. those bigger metropolitan markets. So understanding what your business is equipped to do is really important too. Um, you know, we're, we're really working hard at Brumley Law Firm to get a lot more um, infrastructure in mm -hmm. place to be remote. Yeah. Because as we continue to expand, I'm either going to have to have more space or more remote staff. Here's one and for you. It's expensive to have more space. So remote work is great and all. It's fine. It's the thing to do. But I'm a firm believer. Everyone's not good remote work. That's how, true. How, like, I'm a, I kind of work remote. I don't have enough discipline, right? I, I how, love being in the office with people. How, how do you, like, make sure someone's a good remote worker? Do you have the kind of test you give them? Just, like, work things out? Like, I mean, because everyone's not a good remote, remote worker. I think, Even though they think they are, they're really you're not. Saying, you're saying preemptively before hiring, how can you make sure someone's yeah. a good remote worker? Yeah. I don't think you can. Yeah. I think every job is different and I think expectations and metrics are the only way, clear expectations and metrics are the only way to understand if someone's able to perform a job. Mm -hmm. I have an employee who asked for a six day schedule with like, he wanted to work on Saturdays and um, he he's remote today and we were having a conversation and I was like, I'm just so impressed with the work product that you put out even when you're remote that historically I've not been able to get out of people who yeah. were remote. And it's very clear to me that you take your job just as seriously when you're at home as you do when you're in yeah. the office. And I just wanted to tell you, thank you for that yeah. because I've been burned so much that I'm like reluctant to have this, this idea of being 100% remote for people who might need it because I think, everyone's going to take advantage. That's our knee-jerk reaction as business owners. Yeah. Everyone's going to take advantage. They're just going to have their alarm go off, put on a mouse movement app <laughs> on, so their Teams is always active, and then be like, oh, sorry, I was in the bathroom. Oh, sorry, I was uh, yeah. on my break, you know, and and go back to bed. And that's not how people no, act. People, yeah. And And if you understand that, like, people are wasting their time when they're in your office. Yeah. They're wasting time no yeah. matter where There's they're at. You're not going to get eight yeah. straight hours of work out of someone. Yeah. But that's, you just have to understand that. Yes. That's so that if you're in the office, out of 40 hours, you're probably working 25 at the best. You know. Oh my God. I'm glad that my staff is working so hard because I'm positive. That's not a metric that makes sense for us. But if that's how other offices are run, wow, we're above that. You think about it, if you're in office, you know, you're going by, hey, you see the Seahawks play last night? Yeah. You do this, you do Those that. Kind you know, of all the, all the, the all water cooler yeah, conversations you know? and, and other people talking too loudly on speakerphone and having their conversations loudly where you're not able to focus. And when you're at home, if you have a home office that you can just be, you know, locked in yeah. and just be doing your work, then that's great. But I think a lot of people also benefit from that social interaction. And that's yeah. why they work for your firm. And you get mentorship 
in ways that you didn't expect to get from listening to other people's yeah, conversations. I, I know it's definitely proven that, you know, if you're a first time worker or junior worker, remote work is the fucking worst thing for you, right? Yeah. It's you the worst you thing can't for you. do it. But when you're an attorney with 10 years of experience who's working totally remote, different. it's a whole different thing. Totally different. Whole different thing. But how do you, as an HR uh, advice, like what's the, what's the advice you give to an employer who says, some staff can be remote and some can't because that's not a uniform policy. Yeah. And that's where we really have a hard time. I'm an example, like suppose you have a, a, a construction company, right? Obviously construction people have to be outside working. Yeah. But does your marketing bookkeeper need to be in the office? No. You know, they don't, right? But then how you get over that jealousy and ego, right? I think you have to explain to them like each, you know, like this is your job, this is your responsibility, these are responsibilities, right? Like just as your just so you have to work outside doesn't mean my market person come work outside with you, right? Mm -hmm. Just like, are you going to want to go inside and work as a construction worker? Probably not, right? No. Like you have your lane, right? Yeah. So it's about that it's job and, and what the requirements of that job. Everyone, that kid, yeah. Another thing, too, like another people of mine, like I think a lot of companies, they'll say, we work remotely. Do you really? Mm -hmm. Like, to me, remote work means work from anywhere, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, maybe not from China, you know, Vietnam. But like, you know, if maybe, the time zone is is something that you're yeah. willing to just adjust to and of, be working overnight, a lot of companies like it's like telework. You can work from home, but you have to maybe get in touch in ten minutes, right? That's yeah. not remote work, right? That's no. telework. Yeah, no. yeah, that's the same shift that everyone's on, and we have to be able to access. Your work is you. like you know, be able to go. I don't know, a lot of Vegas, you know, and yeah, from there you know. And as long as your work is getting done, it doesn't matter what time, day or night, it's getting done at. Yeah, and that's really tough too. I think. I think that a lot of what we do in this industry has been when the adjusters are working, when the insurance defense attorneys are working. And so we're really locked into that time frame. But if someone's like, hey, I'm going to be in Atlanta for a week and I'm just going to be working remote for that one week yeah. while I'm in Atlanta, I don't think that there, there's yeah. a problem with that because it, it – it's never going to be live updates on a case. Yeah. You know, I'm sending an email and hoping they get back to me tomorrow. Yeah. That's it. All right. Cool. Let's move, let's move back to you. Is there something out there, like, suppose someone is looking, someone's an accident or, like, or who use a murder, whatever the case be, right? Mm -hmm. Is there something they could go to like, look up lawyers, like, win loss rate? Nope. No. Okay. Nope. Every lawyer is going to just promote themselves in the best light that so they can. There's nothing to say, you know, there's no, the cabinets. there's no statistical measurement. Okay. Uh, should maybe you should start one. Maybe should you should be? start one. I don't know. I think win loss rate is in the eye of the beholder, right? If you went to the insurance company after your car accident, you said, I need 2,500 bucks for my car accident. And they said, gosh, Jason, you're such a good negotiator. Here's 2,500. You got us. You'd count that as a win, yeah. but I wouldn't. And so what's that change in perception? How is that measurable? And so there's never going to be a clear win-loss. When people ask me, how much do I win? Well, I always win because I don't take cases that I'm going to lose on. And if, if an attorney is saying, well, I win 50% of the time, you're not going to sign up with them. Of no. course not. Um, so it, it's it, there's no reasonable way to track that metric there's no realistic way that is is measurable to track that metric especially in this industry where you know if if you're not at fault for the accident and i somehow lose your case that's like malpractice yeah. at that point like that i shouldn't be practicing it as an attorney the the metric isn't did you win or lose the metric should be based on how much that policy limit is. If you had access for the person who hit you's $25,000 policy, if I settled it for 2,500 bucks, that's not a win. If I settled it for $15,000 based on what your injuries are or what your life is like and how much you're expecting to do the treatment, that might be reasonable. But if I got all $25,000, I'm not able to get more than that. That's a win to me. I'm not able to get in excess of what that person who hit you has to offer in their insurance policy. So that's how we measure success at my firm is, did you get the policy limit or not? Okay. If you didn't, why? Is it because they have video footage of this person at the gym and going to raves and snowboarding and doing all this crazy shit 
because the person didn't listen to any of our advice about taking it easy while they were in treatment and obviously they're not hurt, well then, yeah, that's a good reason not to get the policy limits maybe. But in every one of these cases, if someone's really injured and it's a $25,000 policy limit, there's no reason why you're not getting that policy limit from the insurance company unless you're just bad at negotiating or the client's not doing a good job doing the treatment that you need. What does the lawyer have to do to get disbarred? Is that pretty hard to get disbarred? Well, the, the bar association is governed, like it, it's our governing body. So it's, it's like we police ourselves with former prosecutors that get hired by the bar association and are paid by our annual dues and some other ways. And so these bar complaints that people file when you have a shit attorney, the bar complaints get referred to the bar association to either prosecute or dismiss. And if they want to prosecute the bar complaint, then it goes to uh, a hearing potentially. And there's negotiations just like a criminal case where if someone wants to take like a plea deal instead of getting disbarred, where they maybe take a suspension for six months or something like that, they can do that as well. But I, I don't know any attorneys that have been disbarred. Um, I know plenty of attorneys who have had bar complaints, but those bar complaints can get dismissed very easily. A bar complaint does not mean you had a bad attorney or anything like that. It's just sometimes people are like, my attorney charged me too much. Well, did you sign a contract and the attorney said how much they were going to charge you in the contract? Yes. Well, that's not a founded bar complaint. You should have maybe shopped around. If that attorney was charging too much, you would have figured it out in the front end. If your attorney was doing something unethical, based on their billing practices, that's a different complaint. And so understanding what the rules of professional conduct are, which are a requirement for all attorneys to adhere to about what their billing practices are, what their marketing practices are, what their conflict of interest practices are, uh, different things like that. Those are the, the RPCs are what govern professional conduct with, with our industry. And if those RPCs are violated, that's when you're at risk of, of sanctions or, or um, bar compliance issues with being disbarred or, or some other professional conduct issue. If you pass the bar to Washington State, does it mean you can practice law in any state or just only, only Washington? Uh, no. If you pass the bar in Washington, we have what's called the uniform bar exam, and so your score can get transferred into other states. But after you pass the bar, you still have to do a Washington law component exam. And then after you pass that exam, then you can get sworn in to practice law in Washington. But for example, Alaska has a higher score requirement than Washington has for the uniform bar exam. And New York has, I believe, a lower, last I checked, this was years ago, so I'm not up to date on, on getting sworn in in other states. But every year you have to pay dues for the state that you're licensed in. So if I wanted to be like some crazy baller attorney who got licensed in every state that I could, I'd be paying like $20,000 a year to be licensed in states where I never made any money. It doesn't make any sense. So most attorneys are only licensed in one or potentially two you know, states if they uh, have homes in both states or they live in a border town where like I'm between Oregon and Washington, so I don't know which one I'm gonna practice in. But the laws are not the same in every state. So um, a lawyer who's licensed in multiple states, it's sort of that idea of jack of all trades, master yeah. of none. You're not going to be the best if you're trying to spread yourself too thin. If you work for a corporation, suppose you work for a big law firm. I suppose you work for Boston Legal, right, from the TV show. Okay. Does Boston Legal pay all this stuff for you? Are you still responsible for paying yourself? Every Every firm does their own you know, hiring decisions, employment contracts, that kind of thing. Uh, at my firm, we pay all that stuff for you. I can't say for sure that other law firms are exactly the same. They might say, you know, it's up to you to stay up to date with your CLEs, continuing legal education credits that are a requirement for, um, for you to do. It's up to you to pay your uh, licensing fees and all that and stay up to date with that. But um, my business is small enough and, and successful enough that we're able to provide that as a, yeah. as a benefit. So, um, you know, we're always looking for other attorneys, um, other paralegals or law students who are getting ready to take the bar. So understanding that that's a benefit that you, you don't have to pay for if you work at Brumley Law Firm. I think that's another thing that 
brings in those A players, man. But let's suppose there's someone in college right now, sophomore, junior, and they're very interested in becoming a lawyer. What advice would I have for this person? Um, go to court and watch court and understand what area of law you might have an interest in, if you like public speaking or not. There's still lots of law jobs, lawyer jobs you can have and not be interested in public speaking. Um, intern, you know, I... I I had someone on my podcast, uh, ironmindpodcast.com. This podcast has really been a, a, a really educational tool for me as an individual. But I had someone on my podcast who said, if I wanted to be in this industry, I'd find someone like you, Josh, and I'd go, I'd go into your office and I'd say, how can I intern here for free? I'd go pick up your dry cleaning. I just want to be in the rooms with you learning what you do so that I'd be able to bring something of value to you over time. Because as an entry-level attorney, I'm not going to know shit. I don't know how to do this. Everything that you're paying me to do is something you're also going to have to teach me how to do. So if I really cared about being the best, I wouldn't be coming to you with my handout asking for $100,000 a year. I'd be coming to you saying, how can I learn from you? And then when I'm ready, Please tell me that I'm ready and and put me on your payroll. But until then, I'm going to do everything I can to just learn from you. And that's, you know, not something that everyone has the capacity to do. People have bills. They can't work a job for free. But if someone came to me as a, a student and they said, can I have a free internship, an unpaid internship here? I, I can't imagine turning that person away. So next, can you highlight a couple of your tattoos? Oh, geez. Like maybe what kind of meaning they have for you or... Um, well, a lot of my tattoos are just silly that I got while I was traveling. I've, I've got a lot of them from different countries and I just kind of have a bad memory about all my life experience and, and, uh, and a lot of these are from your punk rock days. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of them are, are that or silly. You know, I got a mom tattoo. Shout out to my mom. Um, this one says pizza rules everything around me <laughs> and it's the Wu Tang symbol. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Um, I actually own a little Caesars franchise and the, the business is doing business as Little Caesars, but I had to form my own LLC huh. before operating the franchise, and I named it Prem, which is pizza rules everything mm -hmm. around me. Um, the they're just silly. How I, many do you have? Oh, I don't know, man. I, I haven't counted them. Are you gonna you gonna get any more of them, or you're done? I I think I get them when I travel. Yeah, and and try to just have that memory. So like you know, I've been to a lot of different crazy places in Europe and and um. I was just in Dubai. I got a, a tattoo while I was in Dubai. Um, I just, I think it's so fun to, to reminisce about those things as, as, as I'm sitting here, you know, looking around at all these tattoos, thinking about the funny stories that maybe would take a long time to go into. And um, I think it's just really important to remember and be thankful for the life that, that I've had. And, and it, it was hard work to get to where I'm at, but damn it, I did that. And I'm so exactly, proud. Exactly. So proud. So next, like you already talked about your company some, but now can you go to more detail, like how it got started, what you focus on now, what your big dream vision for the company is moving forward? Yeah. Um, I did a, a general practice law firm almost right out of law school. And I, I had to make friends with attorneys who were doing things that were more focused so that I could learn from them. So I was doing family law with an attorney. I was doing criminal defense work with a different attorney. And I was kind of just like billing them for my time here and there. And then it got to the point where I, I learned enough from them that I was able to take on my own clients doing the same thing. And I, I, I think it's incredibly important in this, in this industry to have someone that you learn from. And, you know, the people who, what's the phrase? No man is an island, right? You, you're not alone. And to be under the impression that you know everything and to be in, on this island by yourself, it's its not true. There's, there's always more you could do. There's always more you can learn. There's always ways you could do better. And when you stop trying, you lose, man. And so I, I always want to add to my network of attorneys who are doing things different than I am uh, as far as practice areas, you know, a social security attorney, a criminal defense attorney, this and that. And, and understand who's the best. 
and and keep my finger on the pulse in those other industries. And if you're not the best, I'm not going to send clients to you. If you're not a hard worker, I'm not going to send the people I care about in my network to your firm to get abused, you know, to be to be sent to um, some paralegal who's going to do all the work. That's not fair to the people that I care about. And what's your goal for it moving forward? Like you want to have like branches at every city in the United States or like, Oh man, you want to become the boss of legal car insurance attorneys. Uh, I don't know. You know, I think, I think having a five year vision has to be flexible. Having a 10 year vision seems so crazy to me. Obviously I'm positive. I'm going to be doing this exact same thing in 10 years, but what that looks like, it's impossible for me to tell. So I try to keep it focused on like, what's my one year vision. What's my three year vision and what's my five year vision. And, um, without giving away too many too many spoilers about the future, I think the growth for my firm is inevitable. The, the trajectory that my business is on right now is, is full speed ahead, man. It's so exciting and it's so invigorating to be a part of that. And, and obviously, you know, I'm seen as this leader and, and it's my business, but there are so many people who contribute so much to what we've accomplished. And, um, they know who they are. Shout out to those people who have been super involved and in, in lead my business. Brian, Elena, Dylan, uh, Daniel, uh, Dan. I, I just I appreciate everyone who's not there at all anymore, who who played a, a really pivotal role in the growth of this business because I would not be here if not for every one of them. Can you share your social media? Some people can reach out to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Brumley is spelled B-R-U-M-L-E-Y, Brumley Law Firm on Instagram, Facebook. Um, we also have ironmind.podcast on Instagram. Uh, the social media presence, I think, is, is just going to continue to explode. It's, it's been really, really awesome. Uh, we work with a, a great social media team that really puts our best foot forward on that social media stuff, and that's how people find us. It's great. So, Josh, anything I should have asked you that I haven't or anything else you want to talk about? Uh, gosh, I, I'm really excited to have... Um, this uh, podcast episode of yours as part of my podcast as well. It's it's really exciting. I've never been able to interview someone while I'm a guest <laughs> on their podcast, but this was like the perfect dual uh, yeah. interview process. So thank you for, for your time. Thank you for setting aside your Saturday to talk with me, man. This has been really beneficial for my business as well. Thank you. So Josh, is, you, you have a lot of value, talk about a lot of things, but is there any last second wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Um, I think being a business owner is incredibly difficult and to remember that these people depend on you to, to set a good example for what this business is and to not be an absent business owner. You can't be involved as, as a leader, as a manager, as, a, as an owner of a business. If you're not physically present and if you don't understand what your staff is doing, you have to know that job as well as they know it to be able to manage them. And if you don't know it, you need to hire someone to manage them who does. Josh, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.